Oh, she, um, she, Janet says she can't join the meeting. Can Pam resend the link by email, please? Uh, oh. I'm going to give it a go. I'm not exactly sure if I can just resend it. It's possible. Doesn't doesn't she get those multiple reminders like yeah. the rest of us? Yeah, yeah. you could sent a reminder uh, this afternoon. She's yes. here in she's here in the attendees. I'm gonna move her over. Okay. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'll never be able to explain that, but all right, uh, Pam, am I right that we are live? We are live. We are recording. You have a quorum. Uh, I've seen Amherst Media is here with us. Um, 634, you look good to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. All right, welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of May 15th, 2024. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.35 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda, posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda where the Zoom link is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town's website. <laughs> Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Colden. I'm here. Fred Hartwell. I am here. Jesse Major. I'm here. Uh, I, Doug Marshall, I'm here. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Here. And Karen Winter. Here. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. To the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the, minute, from the meeting. Okay, time is 6.38. We'll go on to the first item on our agenda for this evening, and that is minutes. Uh, however, I don't believe we have any minutes this evening. Uh, is that correct, Pam and Chris? That is correct. We were close, close but uh, unfortunately, they were not completed. Okay. All right, then we'll go ahead and move on to public comment. Um, time is 6.38. 
and I usually read the names of the people that I see in the as members of the public at this point. And at this evening, I see four names, Chris Chamberlain from Berkshire Design, Erica Johnson, Jane Wald, and Monica Perez Del Rio. I know several of those are here for the next item on our agenda. Do any of the members of the public want to make a public comment at this time? Okay, I am not seeing any hands from the few people that are present. So I guess we'll go on to uh, the, the next item on the agenda. Uh, the time now is 6.39. Uh, we're going to the public hearing for a site plan review. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted. It is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for cit interested citizens to be heard. This public hearing is continued from May 1st, 2024. It's the site plan review 2024-06 um, for the Emily Dickinson Museum at 214 Main Street. Request site plan review approval under section 3.334 of the zoning bylaw to construct a two-story building approximately 1,630 square feet, including wood siding and metal roof, including incidental utility work on 81 Lessee Street and site improvements. Located on map 14B, parcel 24, parcels 24 and 26 in the RG zoning district. Uh, do any members of the board want to make a disclosure this evening? Okay. I made a disclosure when this meeting opened uh, regarding my, uh, my relationship with some donors who, uh, to the museum for this project, but uh, I do believe I can be impartial and objective on, on this matter before us. All right, um, Chris, I see you are back on behalf of the museum. Welcome. Hello, and actually, Pam, if you could add Monica Del Rio Perez, mm -hmm. um, she's from EDM The Architect. Okay, anybody else, Chris? Um, no, I know Jane's in the audience, but I, I think I'll be covering everything that's left. Okay. All right. I assume you have, uh, do you have a presentation you want to make to us as an opening or? Um, yes, right I'll, what I can, uh, yeah, I can follow up quickly on a few items uh, that were brought up and kind of left outstanding last time. Um, there, I think there were four of them that uh, planning staff had forwarded just to make sure we followed up on. Um, and so first was the fire department comments. Um, shortly, as you remember, there were um, a handful of um, really restatement of the code that were uh, given in a letter to the planning department. Um, shortly after our meeting two weeks ago, um, the uh, museum and Amherst College folks met with the fire department to go through the plans. Um, they had a handful of requests and clarifications that were really all having to do with uh, components of the architectural part of the project. Um, things like ensuring there was a Knox box, uh, clarification of smoke detectors, that sort of thing. We summarized the, co the, the meeting uh, in an email and sent that off to the fire department and copied uh, Chris Brestrip on it um, to make sure that, that everything was uh, clearly communicated there. Um, I'm not sure if uh, any acknowledgement from the fire department was given, but uh, essentially they they had a few requests and we um, are happy to provide all of them, although they're not really related to any of the drawings in the site plan review. They're, they're sort of building related uh, and will be integrated there, uh, presumably get reviewed during the building permit process. Um, the discussion of bike racks, um, we, as we indicated last time, um, the museum uh, is happy to provide um, bike racks for the property. Um, the proposed location, which uh, I'm going to show on the plan, uh, and, and Janet may also appreciate that we added this sheet to the plan that shows the entire museum property, uh, which clarifies a little bit more where our project is, as that was a comment she had on the site 
uh, meeting, but we've indicated the location of bike racks right here. Um, and as we indicated, um, the preference from the museum is for these to be a, a rail mounted style that can be moved out of the way uh, in the winter for snow plowing purposes. So um, we'll, we'll be adding um, this or something very, very much like this um, to that location near the Homestead building. Um, there was a request to follow up with DPW on the couple items there. Uh, most specifically, the you know acceptance of the drainage. Um, we did try to email and call with DPW. Did not end up getting any response to those. Um, what I can say specifically about the, the capacity of the dry well is early in the design, we did speak directly with Jason Skeels um, about the drainage layout and the fact that we were going to gather roof runoff in. Um, downspouts, direct those to a dry well, which would overflow to the storm drain. Um, and he indicated that that was perfectly acceptable at that time, although we don't have that in writing. That was a phone call. Um, and then uh, there was a question about backflow prevention um, on the sanitary pump. Um, and yes, just confirming um, for certain the, the E1 pump system that we've spec'd for the project um, has a check valve. That's a pretty typical um, setup for these sanitary pumps that would prevent the, the water from flowing back down into the pump station when the pump turns off. Um, and then aside from that, I did provide um, updated plans to Chris Brestrup and included a list of all of the changes that were included, most of which were um, related to the Conservation Commission. Um, we've incorporated all of the requests for mitigation measures that um, they had made, uh, and we received our Conservation Commission approval last Wednesday at their meeting. Um, and then I believe the only other changes were related to um, a couple of those items that I just mentioned. Um, and Bruce will note that we added uh, clarification on that stoop on the western door. Uh, we have decided that we're going to construct that out of granite pavers. Uh, the, the occupancy of the building is small enough that that does not have to be an accessible entrance. So we're going to um, use that sort of historically appropriate material to build that door pad. All right. Um... Anything anything else before we move along? I believe that's all I had to update on. Okay. Uh, board members, I think we were about ready to go through findings and conditions at our last meeting. Uh, before we do that, uh, does anybody have any questions for Chris or Monica? Janet? Um, I Chris, I wonder, did you say that the build, the the carriage house won't be accessible or you're just using granite pavers it's accessible but you're using materials that aren't sanctioned so there are whatever. yeah so there are two entrances the main entrance will be fully acceptable the okay. second entrance by code is not required to be acceptable because the occupancy is low enough that we don't need that that second and the building small enough that we don't need that second entrance to be fully accessible. Although the the pavers that we're putting out there uh, will be flush with the first floor, um, so it, it could be used uh, by anyone really. It just doesn't technically meet the uh, the full accessibility code. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yes, the the uh, and. Hello, I'm sorry because last week um, in May 1st, I couldn't attend and uh, one of my colleagues, Tim Whitman, was uh, able to attend the meeting. So hello to everybody. Uh, just to complete the information, yes, the uh, visitor's entry would be fully accessible. We modify and, and the, the, the threshold and all of the uh, architectural details in order to provide uh, completely the first floor accessible to the public. Okay, thank you, Monica and yeah. Chris. All right, uh, if there's no more questions, uh, I think we could go ahead and start going through the draft findings. Chris, uh, do you wanna lead us through that? Sure, yep. <clears throat> and Pam is gonna bring them up. Yep. Yeah. So. You say we're going to start with findings? Yes, the findings. OK. All right. I okay. see them. Do you? Yes. Yes. OK. So 
I will read them, and then if my voice fails, which it's been doing, um, maybe someone else could take over, like Bruce. Um, and I wanted to note that we incorporated Bruce's suggestion of making the um, material that was written in section 11.24 in italics, so that could be distinguished from what the actual finding is. All right, great. Um, so do you, are you going to read both the italics and the plain text or just the fine? That was, uh, I was going to read both unless someone okay. has an objection. And I think Bruce has. Uh, yeah. Yes. Bruce? Yes. I thought, uh, we had this discussion last time. It wasn't a discussion. That was really an observation uh, that, uh, possibly from Chris uh, Chamberlain that, that we would be the only town that, uh, systematically read through all of these. And much of this is, um, I mean, we've read these things uh, coming into the meeting. Um, so I'm wondering whether we have to, whether we feel that we have to be so uh, um, uh, uh, diligent, so to speak. Uh, uh, because I was thinking that we could highlight, uh, we instead of reading them all, you could... Uh, give a, a basically take us through the the points of contention because mon, much of this is is not really contentious at all uh, and and it seems like a lot of time spent reading everything if it's uh, if this if it's if it's not um, contentious what do, what do people think about that well i have no objection to that um you know it seems like that's been the usual practice here and uh, I don't know, Chris, how do you feel about that? Me? Um, I have yeah. no problem with just sort of summarizing what's here, um, if that is suitable for other people. All right. Well, when uh, I saw Jesse says his thumb, thumb up, um, Karen has her thumb up. Is there anybody that particularly wants to read all of these? And Janet, I do see your hand. Janet, why don't you speak? I'm sorry. So I actually agree with Bruce. And I, I just have like one add to two sections, a little thing that says lights will be turned off when not in use. And that was my only thing. I thought these were really good. All right. And I would love to skip reading them unless people feel otherwise. All right. All right. So Chris, why don't you start your summary? And Janet, uh, why don't you... Put your hand down and put it back oh, up when we get to the you. sections you wanted to edit. And Bruce, do you? Yeah, are you all set? Okay. If everyone's good with them, do I need to read them? Or does no, I think we've decided we don't need you to read them. Um, in, in in whole, I think we would want to scroll down and see if we can, if you can help us stop at any spots that you think might be contentious or. Uh, substantive enough to have a conversation about. Okay. Um, well, the first one has to do with whether it complies with the zoning bylaw and goals of the master plan, and it does. Um, the second one, 11.2401, is um, minimizing detrimental or offensive actions, which it's not likely to produce. Um, the third, 11.2402, is um, not uh, having a negative impact on abutting properties. Um, uh, Janet? So I would just add where that little section, that little closet says exterior lighting will be minimal and will be downcast. And I would just say lights will be turned off when not in use. Cause that's, this is a requirement of our bylaw. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Provision of adequate recreational facilities. Well, there's a lot of open space and landscaping around this um, property. Um, that's 11.2403, 11.2410, um, protection of unique historic scenic features. Um, that's what this project is all about, is protecting unique historic features and natural and scenic features will be maintained. 11.2411, um, um, <clears throat> Refuse disposal is considered to be adequate. 11.2412, um, um, water and sewage disposal is considered to be adequate. The town engineer has reviewed it. 
11.2413 um, has to do with drainage and the uh, town engineer has agreed to the drainage proposal. Um, 11.2414, adequate landscaping. Um, they're taking down a tree, but they're adding um, at least one new tree and several shrubs to the property and the property is already well landscaped. 11.2415, um, <clears throat> the soil erosion plan is considered to be adequate. I believe that the town engineer would find it to be adequate and it's been through conservation commission review. So that's a pretty good uh, um, indication. Uh, the, the highlight that's on that text, does that, should that uh, be removed? I think it should be, yeah, remove highlight, yep. And you mentioned the Conservation Commission, but they are not referenced here. So you'd like me to reference the Conservation Well, if you think that's a significant fact that we should include. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I will include that. 11.2416, uh, screening. Um, is this, does Janet want us to add anything about, uh, I guess there's nothing about lighting in here. So this yeah, I think is, it's the next one is the lighting. 11.2417, um, exterior lighting, that it's been satisfactory because it's all downcast. Um, and there are two gooseneck lights and Janet would like us to add her. And I would just see, yeah, lighting will be to cast downcast and turned off when not in use and will not shine. So, okay, very good. Um, so that's one seven one eight is protection from flood hazards. This is not in the flood prone conservancy district. Um, protection of wetlands. It's been through the conservation commission and they granted the um, order of conditions, so they they're fine with it. Um, 11.2420 talks about the ability of the planning board to use design review board criteria, but um, we didn't think that that was necessary in this case because the local historic district commission has reviewed the proposal and granted a certificate of appropriateness. 11.2421, um, um, setbacks and placement of parking, landscaping and entrances is all satisfactory. 11.2422, building sites um, avoid steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, and grade changes. There's no uh, apparent problem here. 11.2423, uh, more than one building on the site. They There are going to be two buildings on the site with the addition of the carriage house, and they will be um, historically compatible. Did someone have something to say? Um, I don't see anyone's hand, so. Okay, 11.2424 screening is being provided, um, particularly for the HVAC system that will be behind the building. 11.2430, um, convenience and safety of vehicular and pedestrian movement. Um, we've seen the whole site, we've seen the vehicular access. We haven't heard anything from the fire department that access for them is not uh, available and pedestrian access has been described. So we think that's uh, that criterion has been met. 11.2431, location of curb cuts. Um, there's only one curb cut to this site. There's another curb cut to the uh, site at 280 Main Street. Those appear to be adequate. 11.2432, Location and design of parking spaces, bicycle racks, drive aisles, et cetera. Um, we found that there is our two handicapped parking spaces on the adjacent property at the homestead. There's a drop-off space at the Evergreens, and we know now that there is going to be a bicycle rack at the homestead. So this um, <clears throat> this highlighted air, uh, item can be deleted. Um, 11.2433 access to adjoining properties. There is access to adjoining properties. The two properties are connected and there's a stone dust path that connects them. Um, driveways located in commercial and business districts is not really um, a, a applicable okay. here. Yeah. Joint access driveways, uh, again, is not really ac uh, applicable. Each property has its own driveway. Um, the traffic impact report is going to be waived, I believe. Uh, there's not much traffic coming to the site. And so the uh, aspects of the traffic impact report that would have to be met are not um, applicable. 
So those are the findings. All right. Um, board members, any any questions or comments about those before we move on to the conditions? Bruce? Only to say that I think that was a really well-conducted uh, guide, Chris. I commend you. I think you had perfect pitch on that. So thank you very much. And uh, we did our job and we did it in 20% of the time. <laughs> Any point in taking a vote on those findings or do you want to just wait until the end? Why don't we bundle everything? Okay. So now we're going on to conditions, draft conditions. Um, the pride, so, um, general conditions. Number one, project built substantially in accordance with plans submitted and approved on today's date. Project shall be managed substantially in accordance with the management plan um, approved on today's date. Substantial changes will be uh, brought to the uh, planning board for its review. And if the planning board decides that they are de minimis, that's fine. And if not, they would come back for a modification of the site plan review approval. Um, that probably should strike out reference to special permit. So I see that now. Uh, landscape being installed in accordance with the landscape plan. Um, disturbed areas to be loamed and seeded. Um, number five, site plan review approval shall expire in two years unless it's acted upon. Number six, um, work shall be completed within 24 months from the date of issuance. I guess you might want to ask the applicant if that's an appropriate amount of time or if they will need more time. Yeah. Um, Chris, uh, do you think that the your, the applicant expects to commence within 24 months? Shall be completed within completed. 24 months. Completed. Um, Sorry. I believe the uh, construction would be, we do have some provisions for conservation that extend out three years from the start of work, uh, which may not be relevant here. It's it's uh, invasive species mitigation and that sort of thing. Um, but I think we're we're certainly confident that the the actual construction will will be completed by then. Okay. Uh, Chris, is there any reason we shouldn't make ours three years just to be consistent with the uh, Conservation Commission? I don't see any reason why not, but um, does anyone else object to that? Janet, I see your hand. So this the two-year um, substantial completion or construction is a requirement under state law for a site plan for special permits. And so I think we probably do have the discretion to give them an extra year, but I think it's just our convention. Maybe actually, maybe it's two years in our bylaw too. I'm, I'm forgetting. Two Excuse me. It's two years to be acted upon. It's not two years to be completed. Even for yeah, a special think... permit, you have two years to start construction and then um, continue it in a diligent manner. Yeah. So there's so... that. Like, yeah, and I think that might be in our bylaw for both. But I just think if they don't need, I mean, I I don't know. I, not against three years. I just wondered if, you know, why would we do it here when we always do two years for all our other permits? But I just I do think our bylaw has language about you know substantial completion or construction within two years or whatever. So okay, I, all right. I'm, I'm I'm fine with leaving it. It just seemed like if there was work that was required by the conservation commission that could be done between two and three years from now you could probably construe that that's work under this site plan review. And I don't, yeah, but, I think but yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not an attorney yeah. and I'm not going to argue about it. So okay. let's leave it alone and go on. Um, just to note that if more time is needed, they can come back to the planning board and ask for it at a public meeting. Okay. Um, Okay, number seven, uh, on-site utilities shall be underground. Number eight, all exterior lighting shall be dark sky compliant, downcast, shielded, and not shine onto adjacent properties. Janet, did you want to add yeah. um, something to that about um, your note? You know, I yeah, why not? Because I think we've already said it, but sometimes you can't say things enough, as someone said in a meeting yesterday. So okay. that's fine. No, I think it's more important in the conditions than in the findings. Yep. Air conditioning, et cetera, shall be screened. 
Uh, you know it is. Um, utility work shall be conducted following the regulations of the Town of Amherst. Uh, applicant shall provide the planning board um, with specifications about bike rack site furniture benches. So we have specifications about the bike rack. We don't know if there's much site furniture, but I think there was a bench mentioned somewhere. And um, so if you could, if they could um, submit the bench, uh, they don't have to come to a meeting, but if they just submit the bench, then you can approve it at a, at a public meeting. Okay. Chris? Um, number 12. Yeah, and, um, Monica can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that the bench was uh, a holdover from an original idea we had about demarcating the front end of that ADA space. And instead, uh, we've proposed boulders there. So we don't actually have um, a bench proposed anymore. So the bench has been deleted. Okay. Right. And that's reflected on the plan. Um, it may have ended up in the in the written application. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, number 12, repairs and improvements to the right of way shall be completed um, by the applicant um, if, in, if necessary. Uh, number 13, crosswalks, sidewalks, and parking spaces within the town right-of-way that are disturbed shall be reconstructed to match existing um, in the management plan. Number 14, um, all of that activity that's described there shall happen between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday, except for emergencies. Number 15, um, the project shall comply with the management plan and alterations to the management plan shall be approved at a public meeting. Number 16, no work including demolition shall take place prior to all, approver, all, all approvals and permits being issued. Um, and then the construction are kind of the boilerplate things that we normally include. I'm not sure that number 17 is actually necessary, but it probably doesn't hurt to leave it in and let the building perm, uh, building commissioner say that it's not um, necessary. So um, yeah. that has to do with a meeting that we hold prior to construction. Right. And then whether there's a written fire management plan, I don't know in this case whether that will be necessary. It's certainly necessary for some of the high-rise buildings that we see, and not high-rise, but five-story buildings that we see around town. But 17 and 18, I had questions about, and I didn't get a chance well, to ask the building do, commission. Do you want to just insert something like, if required? If required by the building commissioner. How's that? Right. Or the fire chief. Or fire chief. Then... Yep. Okay. That's good. Um, then the construction logistics plan is described, which is pretty much the same as it always is. Um, we often we often don't read all of these. We often do skip we, these. Yep. We need to. Are there any that are really specific to this project? I don't think so. Okay. I think they're all kind of boilerplate. Um, 29, 30, 31, 32, those are boilerplate. 33, yep, yeah, all boilerplate. So I don't think you really need to scrutinize those too much all right okay all right um so i'm see i'm i've, I've heard three things that we're going to want to uh approve and then we're going to want to close the hearing uh we're going to want to waive the traffic impact report we're going to want to approve the findings as uh, the draft findings, as but as edited in our meeting. Uh, and likewise, for the conditions, uh, approve them as edited in the meeting and then close the hearing. Um, board Thank members, you. and does anybody else want to make any more comments about this project? Any questions? Any Anything else for Chris and Monica while we have them? Okay. All right. So um, why don't I go ahead and say the, say make a motion? Um, actually, before I do that, I will. I, I think it, seeing who's in attendance, I'm not sure I really need to do this. But are there any members of the public who would like to make a comment on this hearing, uh, on this topic, uh, before we close the hearing?
Bruce, you're not a member of the public. I'm seconding your motion. Oh, well, hold off. Okay, I don't see any hands from any of the public. So I will go ahead and, and say, I would make a motion that we approve uh, site plan review 2024-06, including waiving the requirement for a traffic impact report, that we approve the findings as drafted by our staff and edited in this meeting tonight, and that we approve and adopt the conditions uh, as drafted by our staff and approve and edited in this meeting tonight. And then uh, that we close this public hearing. Bruce. Second. Thank you, Bruce. All right, board members, any, any further conversation? You're all very quiet tonight. All right. All right, we'll do a roll call. Uh, starting with you, Bruce. I approve. And Fred. I approve. Jesse. I approve. Janet. I approve this particularly attractive pro project. I think it's going to be a great ad. And Johanna. Approve. And Karen. Approve. All right, and I'm approved as well. That's seven in favor, no abstentions, no opposition. And I'll echo Janet's comment to Chris and Monica and Jane, who's in the audience. Looks like a great project and we hope to see it soon. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, thank you. Good night. Very good, good night. Okay, time now is 7.11, and we can move on to the fourth item on our agenda, which is the Amherst Historic Preservation Plan. Chris, uh, do you wanna introduce this, or is Nate in the audience in order to do this? Nate is in the audience, so if Pam could bring him over, that would yeah. be good. I also wanna say that we heard from Shannon Walsh from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, who uh, wrote this plan and she has to jump off at 720. So maybe we should um, truncate the introduction and let uh, Shannon speak for 10 minutes and then Nate will handle it after that. So I'm not seeing Shannon oh, at all. Either. Oh, what's that, what's that uh, Pam? Maybe this Erica. You don't see Shannon at all. Oh, so go, why don't you bring Erica Johnson over and she's got her hand raised. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you should bring Nate too. I did. You did bring Nate. Well, he, he, he didn't, he didn't she, come. He didn't come. Nate, remote panel. People can say no, thank you, which Nate must be saying no, thank you. Nate might be on his phone. He, he might be. Child okay. driving to do. Oh, there's right. Shannon. There's Shannon. Hi. All right. Welcome. Welcome, Shannon. Hi there. Sorry about that. My We share a Zoom here at PVPC, and I frequently come up as my colleague, Erica Johnson, and I could not figure out how to change it when I was in the waiting room. So my apologies for being incognito. Um, I will just say that um, I'm happy to be here tonight. I'm excited we're at this point in the process. We had a great meeting with the Historical Commission recently and just kind of went over the final plan. I haven't really come with anything to say. Nate just invited me to come if there were any questions, but I unfortunately do have to jump off. I have a commitment for my daughter at 745. So um, I'm here though until that time, until about 720, 725. Um, I think I can make it home from then if, if any questions come up. Okay, thank you. Oh, Nate has his hand raised. Let's, see. Let's bring him over. Drag him over here. Let's see if he'll, if he'll come. Nate, I'm trying to promote you. Oh, here he comes. Okay. All right. Here we go. Hello, Nate. 
Hi, how you doing? Good. How are you? Good. So, uh, do you do you have anything you want to say to us about this preservation plan as an introduction? Uh, since Shane has to leave quickly, I'll just I'll, I'll also make it short for now. You know, the idea to bring it to the planning board is to have the board look at it and then vote it to uh, incorporate it as part of the master plan. And so, you know, that doesn't have to happen tonight, but we wanted to bring it to you for discussion. It could be continued, but you know, we think that there's some nice action steps and implementation strategies that, you know, the historical commission will follow from this plan. And it's something that the planning board could then discuss, uh, you know, in the next few years too. Uh, so that's, that's really part of it really. And, you know, there's a 2005 plan. This is an update uh, that we focus really on making it an action plan with achievable goals and strategies. And I think, you know, if you use the 2005 plan and then this plan, I think it gives a really nice comprehensive history of Amherst. And so some of the focus here was also more on what, you know, what can the commission and town do moving forward and not, you know, an exhaustive research on the history of Amherst. So. Okay. All right. So it sounds like we can have some conversation tonight. We don't need to vote to recommend that this be part of the master plan or did you say, Nate, that we need to vote voted into the master plan or we recommend to town council that we vote that they adopt it? I think the planning board could vote to uh, incorporate it into the master plan. Um, it doesn't, that doesn't have to happen tonight, but I think eventually it'd be nice to have that, right. you know, be, be part of so it. It's a, not... it's a direct vote. We're not recommending to town council. Right. right. Yep. Okay. All right, Janet, I see your hand. So I skimmed this, this this afternoon, and it just looks like a great document. I stopped myself from reading all the history. I'm going to do that on an airplane tomorrow. Um, so I just skimmed through it. I've read the previous um, preservation plan. I wondered, like, I was a little overwhelmed with the number of action steps or the priorities. And I was wondering for each of you, like, what would you be your top five or your top three action steps or that things that really have to be done? I would say top three, but I think that'd be too hard. Janet, are you addressing that to the members of the board or you're asking I was... Shannon and, and Nate? Because it seems like maybe the Historic Commission would be the ones to set the priorities. Um, I was going to ask Shannon because I know she's in a rush, but also Nate because he's he's deep in he's deep in this process. So just to, you know, just like what do you think those top five are? Um and if you don't want to answer it, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll jump in just real quick that um, some of them are, it, there's phases of, of what can be done. So it, it just depends on what, what the priorities are. So they're not, it, there's, we ha have short term, midterm, long range. Um, so that's what we were trying to spell out in this. And one of the things that the Historical Commission gave us feedback um, for what they wanted to see in this plan was don't, like, don't it could be great to give a whole laundry list of all the things to do, but if they're not achievable, it's not really yeah. going to be a practical um, plan for them to follow. So we tried to look at what the priorities were also based on outreach from the stakeholders, from the survey to the community, from the meetings we had with you, the meetings we had with the commissions, and figure out um, also in the framework of state, federal and state recommendations for preservation planning. Um, so this isn't really directly like, you know, give me the short list of what we should do first. It's some of the things you have to back up, like you have to back up update documentation, because even though Amherst has a massive amount of documented resources, it's considered outdated by the state. Um, so we, Nate did this great map where you could see the ages of um, properties to kind of give a sense of, of the way that Amherst was built and the patterns of development, but also the ages of when this documentation went into Mass Historics database. If it was anything earlier, if it started with a one and a nine, it's it's outdated. Even if it started with a two and an O, it's outdated. So there's a lot of different steps, but um, it's not just something you can give a, a quick short list of what to do first. Okay, fair. Yeah, and I will say that the commission has taken this and the chair has made a matrix and the commission has been talking about it. What would be the first, you know, three priorities and looking at making subcommittees to implement this. And so, you know, one has been like a barn tour they've talked about, uh, you know, do some, doing some public engagement around, you know, some of the pieces of the plan. Um, 
updating the inventory forms is really important. You know, even looking at like mid-century modern homes, you know, say 1940s to 60s, uh, outbuildings is still something that's interesting. They, they're kind of disappearing as they lose functionality. Uh, you know, parts of the history that were never really researched. Um, but I think, you know, the public outreach and education component is something that they've talked about. How can they get the community more engaged? And then that could also then lend support for projects, whether that's, you know, CPA funding or, you know, if it's a private uh, project. And so, you know, the so many of the resources are privately owned and held. And so some of it is kind of, you know, what, you know, what can happen? How do we, how do you educate the public about that or the owners themselves? And, you know, when Shannon was doing the outbuilding survey and some of this plan, I mean, some of the farming uh, families, you know, they have so much history and they're, they're actually would, you know, I think they would welcome, it seems like they're always excited to talk about the history of the, of the property. And so that kind of inspired like, okay, what can, what could the commission do to uh, help, you know, more people learn about it or hear about it. And so they're, they're kind of, they're going through that, but I think there's definitely a few that they would love to do in the next year or two. And, and we did on page 50, it's chapter four, the action plan and implementation strategies, which it's a, it's a lot to digest. Um, we tried to break it down, historic resources, inventory, survey, and designation priorities. And there's a couple of suggestions, cultural resource priorities, and then municipal bylaws, regulations, and policies, priorities in that. So we tried to break it down into different categories. Um, and then it's really just, like Nate said, the the work begins with okay, what is the what is the the current capacity able to do first? I mean, I tried to make the people responsible for these things or the groups or whatever not all just fall on the historical commission because that was also something the commission said. Like we in the two thousand five plan, there were great suggestions, but they're all volunteers. Like we can't possibly do all these things. Um, so it really is a you know community municipal wide effort with a lot of different people kind of being part of this process. Okay. Um, so, so you know, I, I see that the report is 124 pages, uh, and I doubt any of us really had a chance to go through it all uh, before this meeting. Chris, would it make sense for us to put this on the schedule in another month or something? Yes. Uh, and, you know, give people a chance to look at it on, on however many planes they're on, Janet, um, between now and, and uh, the middle of June. Uh, Fred, I see your hand. Uh, yeah, uh, to anyone that can answer, I was looking at the uh, cultural resource inventory, uh, the Appendix H, and I, um, again, I haven't had time to really get into this, but I noticed that there is a difference of color code uh, in the, uh, I guess it's the, one of the columns has a color code that changes. And I was wondering what the, what the significance of that is. And I was also just wondering generically how the the this uh, is organized and how you get a property on it or off of it so appendix h is the the highlighted red section is the date that the inventory that the documentation was done so that's the example that i was talking about these were done in 19 in the 1970s um, so that was just something that we highlighted. And then I believe this came from your office, Nate, because there were different colors by decade, um, just as a way. That, so Mass Historic doesn't currently have documentation. This kind of important when they'll always ask you, OK, when was the inventory form done, especially if somebody wants National Register listing or something like that. But the documentation standards have changed so drastically or if a, the commission's trying to determine maybe let's say a demolition has been proposed. What's the history of this property? Is it locally significant? If they'll look at something that's older, it might not really have any information at all. So that color coding was something that originated um, with planning when they were trying to help us give kind of a visual of, of what all of these properties when they were documented. Um, 
what was the other thing I was, oh, you were talking about as you go through this document, if you're able to go through it online, I tried to put as many links in as possible just so that there would be places to go when, when there's something that um, is referenced that has a link, it, it's somewhere that you can then go on to get more information about whatever the link goes to. Um, and right. I do apologize because I have to jump off, but um, Nate and Christine can follow up with any questions. We're doing just some housekeeping with putting links in the table of contents so that it will jump to those things within the document. But other than that, I th and, and some other maybe bullet points and things to make what you're looking at a little clearer, but feel free to send any other questions my way. My apologies for jumping off. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say that the... Um, um, uh, the inventory. So she mentioned we have, you know, there's a, over a thousand properties and, you know, the inventory gets filed with the state and then it could be used for other purposes. But most of the forms, like she said, if they were completed even 20 years ago for an architectural description, it might be one line for the, for the history of the, say the owners or any cultural history, it might be a line and there's really no appendices. And so now Mass Historic wants, you know, a little bit more thorough research. And so it does take a bit of time to complete these and uh, updating them is important. I think, Fred, you may have asked, like, how does a property get on or off of it? And I, I guess I, I'd want, I guess I'd want to know more about that. There's really no, um, you know, once a property is inventoried, it's, it is in this database that the state maintains, MACRIS, and uh, it's available online as a public thing. But it, the, de the completing an inventory form doesn't designate a property one way or the other. It's just, it's kind of an inventory record of, of properties. And so, you know, I'm not sure what, what you mean, like how, I don't know, you know, if like a property owner doesn't want to be living in a historic house, they want, they, I don't know, they don't want it to be inventory. I, I guess I, I, if you have a further follow-up question, I'd be curious. Uh, well, yeah, I just, I'm just, I, I, again, I'm, I'm, woefully ignorant here about this and i want to get unignorant and i'm just curious how how the contents of this were assembled um uh, and whether that is an ongoing process and if so how does it work you mean the 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 thousand properties that are listed, or yeah, I mean, uh, uh, how does the one thousand and first and first property uh, show up on the next edition of this? Yeah, yes, actually, the commission's been talking about that. So what what a town will do is, um, we've talked about trying to get some funding for it. You can do a you know, it's like a survey to prepare for for inventorying property. So you look at, you know, the decades when homes were built, what's been inventoried, where are their gaps, and, you know, what might be threatened resources, whether it's, say, outbuildings. And so we had PVPC a few years ago look at, you know, 150 outbuildings, barns, carriage houses, whatever, corn cribs, and identify priorities uh, there. Um, so it's, it's, you know, there isn't... Um, there's probably many different ways, but the, right now the commission is actually looking at trying to, you know, look at every, all the properties that have been inventoried, where are their gaps, what do we think is important, and then kind of coming up with some lists and just do exactly that. And so it could be that, you know, a homeowner could complete an inventory form. They could say, wow, you know, I live in this 1960s, you know, great example of, you know, some period architecture and, you know, I don't see it anywhere and they could start it and then they could request it and then, the town can submit it to the state. So, you know, voluntarily properties can be added, but if the town for the commission, they want to have, you know, right, like I said, a plan, an outline, and, you know, say for, you know, get $20,000 from a grant or CPA and say, we're, we're going to inventory the next, you know, hundred, few hundred properties or whatever that can get us. So you're saying it's predominantly the historic commission that surveys properties in town and thinks about priorities and right. then either they or or someone assisting them would help set the priority and and do the uh the information form right and you know as shannon mentioned unfortunately probably it's probably like a thousand of those 1300 forms are now considered outdated by mass historic <laughs> um 
you know, and they were done with a typewriter or by hand. And so what Mass Historic has done, and they've scanned those and attached them to this online map, but uh, they would like it now to be, a, you know, a, a digital, like, you know, a character recognized digital copy file that could be keyword searched or something or added to more easily in the future. And so it's actually, it's actually, a, it's a lot of work. We, um, Shannon was doing it for studying uh, the expansion of the East Village National Register District. And most of those properties are in older forms and mass historic said, we won't even consider the expansion until every property is on a new form. And so it you know becomes like, okay, well, you know, we have to spend time doing 50 new forms, uh, you know, just to get well, conversation. Yeah. And I guess you, every 20 years that you have to redo them because the standards are gonna change. I'm hoping, yeah, I mean, technology might change, <laughs> but hopefully if it's in a database that they they can draw, take the information from that in the future, they could then, you know, take that information and update it themselves as opposed to putting it on the communities. Like they don't want to sit there and type over. Yeah, you know. well, I don't know that they have a lot of resources of their own either. Right. Okay, Fred, uh, are you all set? Well, I just, uh, again, I'm, uh, Woefully ignorant here. Uh, I'm thinking, uh, just for example, the the house that I own. Uh, I've done extensive historic research, including looking at the original 1868 deed, uh, which is fascinating because for the first 80 years of the house's existence, it was entirely in the female line, even though, and there's no mention of the husband. And we don't know why that happened, but nevertheless, uh, it was entirely in the female line, first the mother and then uh, her daughter. And uh, it's, it's fascinating. And I've written all that up and documented it. And so, you know, I look at that, I'm just wondering how that information might get into this kind of a mm -hmm. resource. Well, it sounds like maybe if you touched, uh, contacted the Historic Commission, they could give you some advice on that. Yeah, yeah I would say email me and then, you know, we could uh, send it to Mass Historic. So that's the kind of research that, you know, for a new inventory form, people might do the deed research to just see something like that. Um, whereas before they might just say, oh, you know, Mr. So-and-so lived there and he, you know, was a shop owner and that that was it. But Mass Historic wants a little bit more uh, deed and you know genealogy research on properties. Okay, uh, Janet. So just to get people excited about reading this report, there's in the history section. There's a lot of new information about African American families and slaveholding in town, and also Indigenous people. And so that was just fantastic to see, like all this new history. It's coming back out or being written up or finally read. And so that was really interesting. The other thing I was thinking about, because, you know, I kept on looking at this, the work plan or the action plan. And I was just, I, if I was on the historic commission, I'd be overwhelmed. And I, I began to wonder, could, is, you know, we have three academic institutions um, in town. And, and I, even in the high school, like when my son took, there's a, Chris Gould has, has this whole project where you take a building and you write up the history of it. And someone did that for our house and my sons did it for houses in downtown. And I just wonder if there's some way to kind of activate the history departments of the high school and the, the colleges to see, can they participate in this or parts of this plan to make it, you know, they, it'd be great projects for students, you know, research projects and things, so. Well, that's a, that's a suggestion yeah. that the Historic Commission could take up. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I think I'll, I'll bring it to them. Okay, uh, Chris, I see your hand. I had a question for Nate. Um, I know that recent research was done for the Lincoln Sunset Local Historic District. And if people wanted to find out what a real good form would look like, is that a place to look? Because I know, you know, people like Maureen Adams and others did a lot of research to you know, establish that district. And I know they did research at the library, et cetera. So would those, um, that information from the local historic district commission be useful for 
planning board members to see what those forms might look like, or is that just completely different? Yeah, no, I was a new, um, if, uh, this is the uh, state, you know, uh, put made an online map so you could click on a property and you can click on a form. And so, you know, if you download it, uh, I should have done this before, um, it will load and you can get a PDF. It looks like it's not going great right now. So yeah, if you're on, if you search Macris maps and just click through Amherst, you could see what a nice inventory form is. Um, this is probably an older one. And so they've, you know, they've digitized the front page was, yeah, so here's one that was completed a while ago. And it's just, you know, um, I'll zoom in, you know, most of the fields are blank. Uh, you know, so this is, this would be, you know, this is probably done in the eighties. Yeah. 88, we had a lot done then. And for, oh, they have a little bit more for the architectural description. So they have a little bit here, but for, right, for Lincoln Sunset, you know, Susanna Fabing, uh, Muspratt, um, and some of the residents of the district did a really nice job. So what you'd see here, instead of being a few lines, it'd be a full paragraph. They would have maybe uh, here for the historical significance, more of a chronological um, history of owners and what how it played into different you know uh, time periods of town. And then their bibliography is would be like you know eight sources, not just one or two. And so uh, it does take a little bit of time. Special collections is a great resource, you know, now with online databases so like newspaper.com or different ones that, that can happen too. Um, but yeah, a new one and then, you know, updated pictures and a map and all those fields are now digital. So they want, that's where they want the, you know, a new form so that I think essentially to make that, that map work that was just there, they have a, you know, everything goes into a database that Mass Historic manages. Okay. Uh, Bruce. Um, just to commend uh, Janet's suggestion to you, Nate, uh, um, uh, in, in my fourth year of a six-year architecture uh, studies in Melbourne, in Australia, uh, 50, 60, 50, uh, quite a while ago, um, we had uh, as students to produce uh, uh, a, a study through the course of the year on a, one of our uh, uh, courses. Uh, exactly that, either a building or an architect or something. And it was a terrific resource over many years. Uh, and, and I think just looking at what you put up on the screen, it, it, uh, the level of uh, research and so forth that we did as fourth year students was pretty uh, sophisticated relative to this document. But this does seem exactly the uh, plane of uh, sophistication that a high school student could handle. Or a well, you know, or uh, or a, a, a somebody in the an undergraduate, for example. So I th I think the, the uh, usually I'm I'm less enthusiastic about the idea that you can tap into educational facilities to do things that we want because I always have to remind myself and others that the uh, purpose of uh, the, the the students are basically their priorities is to is to is, is for their own studies and we can't expect them to prioritize our needs over theirs but this is one of those conditions i think where the two would be very much in parallel and i don't think there'll be a lot of tension or uh, between the interests of the town and the interests of the student here and 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 so i think that as janet says that uh, finding the right uh, faculty and one or other or many institutions around and 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 getting them to develop programs that we can continue and, and and can be you know can happen year after year is really the way to do this. I mean, it really is. We have a unique opportunity, and uh, and and it's 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 staring us in the face. I couldn't agree with more with you, Janet. This is the way to do it. Yeah, and I'll let me just share my screen again, just so you know, here's a newer form. Just you know, I clicked on some property on Lincoln Ave. You know, similar format here, updated picture and map. And then, you know, the research here, the, um, you know, here's this historical narrative, much longer and more detail. And then the bibliography, if you look at it here is really extensive, right? So, you know, so even if, so this is what, that, what could be found. And sometimes there's a continuation sheet with additional photographs. So here's the older form. So what you saw here was, you know, not a ton. And what they added was, you know, a lot more research uh, and typed up in a form then that, you know, this is what Mass Historic wants. So, yeah, I agree. I, I think it's interesting. I, I, you know, 
can this be combined with a certain curriculum or could it just be a goal of having a few so many forms a year tied to certain research and so you know it's a big job but if you chip away at it it, it can you know it's manageable All right, any more conversation about the historic preservation plan? Karen. Uh, as part of the local historical commission of Sunset Lincoln, we were trying to do this, exactly this research on the North Pleasant Street houses because we, want to, we were considering how we could perhaps expand the district. And we, I spent a lot of time in special collections, as a matter of fact, the special collection person did most of my work, but it it do, it's very time consuming. You do learn a lot uh, if you do it right, the, the modern way. There were a lot of contradictions and um, it, it was wonderful to be constantly sort of going to all the books in the special collections and trying to find our way in. But, but without guidance, you're pretty much lost. So I do see maybe educating some of the social studies teachers, uh, the, civics teachers at the high school um, and then having a project where every student could do one. I see that as, as a real great exercise. I, I learned a lot and I also see how frustrating it is because some of the things just really didn't add up and you could see that the form over the years, some of them were contradictory. So it's interesting. That's the great thing that they learn is that isn't being in a straight line. I mean, that's the fundamental lesson in doing this kind of stuff. Uh, it's it really is a fabulous opportunity, I think. All right, thanks, Karen. And thanks, Nate, for leading this conversation with Shannon Absent. Um, okay, so Chris, do you think we can put this back on the agenda in another month or so? Mm -hmm. We have um, dates in June of June 5th and June 26th. I would suggest the 26th because I think the 5th is getting kind of full. Okay. So, is that okay, Nate? Does that sit, suit your timeline? Yeah, I mean, I was going to say that the document is long. There, uh, you know, half of it or more than half may be appendices, and so you know, uh, you know, there's an uh, an executive summary, and then the chapter four, the action step and implementation strategies, is not, you know, a few pages. So. Not that I would say to skip everything else, but you know, as you're reading it, if you know, if you want to, you know, the document can be managed in, in chapters or sections, and so um, you know, some of it I, we like the, the historical commission, like the way PVPC organized it, and then that you know, you could take chapter four, and that would be a standalone piece that you know that could then be distributed to different organizations or people, and so you don't necessarily have to get all the background, uh, but it is helpful. I think it is a nicely written plan. All right, Jesse. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to clarify. So it's going to come back in a month, <clears throat> and our our goal will be to have a vote to recommend as part of the master plan. That's when the budget time to look at it. That's right. That, that's what we're going to try and do. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Okay. All right. So we'll move on to the next item on our agenda. Uh, University Drive, the potential housing overlay zone. Continued discussion regarding concept for an overlay zoning district to allow more housing with a mix of apartment buildings and mixed use buildings and ideas for streetscape design. Um, Nate, I think you've been leading this conversation. Do you want to introduce what you what we might talk about tonight? Sure, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so what I was going to, you know, I wanted to take a step back and talk again about kind of the purpose of the overlay and what the intention was. And I, I actually think we're kind of going astray here. So I think on University Drive, we have a unique opportunity to actually house students uh, and have greater density than we would in other places in town. And so, you know, what I'm seeing is, you know, we people were worried about Barry's project on down in downtown. There's the petition on North Whitney where people were concerned about Fearing Street. And it's like, I think we have to have a conversation about where can we allow density and where do we want students to live? And so I think, you know, right now, what we're having, what, the, what we have in the overlay actually, I don't think would get used. And I think it would actually limit the development potential there. And so I'd wanna step back and say, you know, 
limiting the building footprint, requiring a certain amount of open space beyond wetlands and setbacks, having parking requirements, uh, stepping back upper floors, having a 50% commercial requirement, all those things I think are to the detriment of actually getting housing. And so in my mind, you know, the magnitude of what we want to have in terms of housing and, and, and for students, I think we need to talk about students is, you know, more than let's try to do 20 units here, 20 units there. And so to me, if we move on and say, let's talk about rezoning East Amherst, we want to have four stories and three stories and all this different housing in um, East Amherst, that housing to me is going to be students because that's where the market is right now. And it's really hard to zone for end users. And so I, I don't think we can get too upset at someone who's going to propose an apartment building somewhere and then find out that most of it's going to be students because that's where the market is going. But I think with University Drive, I think we have the ability to say, let's actually try to say we're going to create a thousand units, a thousand beds, um, you know, to start, start creating a dent in it. You know, Hadley's looking at some creative zoning. I think, you know, we can bring this to the university and say, look, here's what we're trying to do. Can there be another public-private partnership? And even if there was, that might be years away. But I think the private market on University Drive would move faster than a P3 at UMass. And so there's already a variance that was granted for the corner of University Drive and Amity and that'll be coming to the planning board. And you know, there were no there was no opposition at the ZBA, and everyone seemed to really like that project. And so um, in my mind, you know, that's the kind of thing we want to have happen with the overlay. And I think where we're going right now, that kind of project actually wouldn't happen. Uh, and I actually think apartments in, on University Drive can be okay, maybe having some distance requirements or even limiting the number, but, you know, requiring only mixed use buildings to me is something that, that may not end up getting used. And so, you know, that's where I want to go. I want to step back a little bit and say that if every time now a project is going to come up in downtown and we're like, well, what happens when it becomes 90% students? Can we, can it come back to the planning board and have a new management plan? I think we're missing the bigger opportunity to say, well, how can we house students somewhere? UTAC identified this, a previous study identified this. I mean, there was a study in 1990, it was like regional housing commission, how, college housing or house, affordable housing in college communities sponsored by the state. And it looked at Amherst and a number of communities. And so I feel like, you know, we've been having, the town's been having this conversation for decades and it's not getting easier, but I do think that it's something we need to discuss. And so before we keep working on the overlay and getting into all the details, I just want to have that conversation again. Uh, the Housing Trust picked it up. Uh, they're going to talk about it next month. They talked about it the other week. And so they're in support of, you know, density there. Uh, you know, they haven't gone down to specifics, but kind of like the planning board in general, they really think this is a great idea for infill and redevelopment. They haven't jumped on it, but, you know, they, they think, well, why couldn't we have a target number of beds and really push for it? Because it could actually then start changing the equation so that other areas in town might see relief from uh, the pressures of student housing. So Nate, I, I assume that your sense that we're going astray is coming from some of the comments that you've received from the planning board. Right. And, at the, and it's been a while since we've discussed this. I think it was in February. And then afterwards, I received comments. But you know, there was discussions about limiting the building coverage to still around 30 or 35 percent. And I think you know, we could be more flexible. Uh, I think having certain parking requirements is a way to say no, because if you still want to have two units for, you know, two parking spaces for dwelling unit, then, you know, that might actually be a deterrent. I think we have to be flexible on parking. I think developers, because there's no streets nearby that offer parking, someone's not going to come in and say, well, they can just park on Lincoln and walk half a mile. I think they're actually going to have to consider who's the user and how that parking and space and property will be developed. And, you know, that's what, um, you know, he's talked with attorney Reedy. That's what they did on the project that came to the variance. You know, they are, you know, providing a lot of parking um, and then because they think it's necessary for that project in other parts of town, they may not require that much because they think, well, there's different options, whether it's on street or public transit or what have you. So, you know, those are the types of things, you know, we have usable open space. I think we say 20% of a building footprint needs to be usable open space. And, you know, is that really, do we have to require that of every site and every project? And I, so those are the things I think are actually going to become detriments to the overlay. And actually, I think if we passed it the way it was now, is now, I'm actually not sure any developer would use it. I actually think it would be something we'd go through this effort and it actually wouldn't be an advantage to 
to actually get used. Okay. Um, all right. So I see hands from Janet, Bruce, and Jesse. So, and Karen. So why don't we start, Janet? You know, it was kind of like watching one of those shows where like people, you know, those singing shows where you people just hit the buttons and in, in quicker, right? Nate, I'm really glad you brought this up because I was um, thinking similar things like what are the goals of this district? And we did talk earlier about whether it should be a student housing district, which I think is a recommendation in one of the housing studies, the market study or the production plan. Um, you know, I think one of the goals is to increase density, like in what is basically a village center, in order to take the pressure off of residential neighborhoods. And I would suggest that as we increase density, we should decrease density in the residential neighborhoods, or else the whole town will just become this build out, and hopefully not just filled with students, hopefully a good mix of people. Um, so I, you know, I think, you know, I also really appreciated the way you put the the um, the information together, because it's like there's we you know it seems like the planning board has sort of a a vision and an i set of ideas and the planning department has a different set of the ideas i think if you did a venn diagram you know probably 80% or 60% you know is in the middle and my thought was you know we don't have to go back and forth like this i think it's our next step is to take these ideas and these issues which are hot and interesting and contact the property owners who are there, contact the businesses, contact the residents who live in the area or in literally in the district, like at the arbors um, and the, the adjoining area and, you know, invite the public. But to say, you know, here's what we're talking about. What is what ideas do you have? What's your reaction? Um, should it be a student housing district? Should we say no, nope, you know, parking, let the developers decide invite developers because, you know, Barry Roberts has more expertise in this than obviously me. And just to have a, a step where we just talk to people and get their input and ideas and then go forward with something more concrete. And I just think it's that time to, we have two visions. They're very similar, but there's different, you know, I know people want on the planning board, want to see a really active street of commercial properties and people walking day and night and having beers like they do in Belgium, even in the, in the winter with a blanket and just a very vital street. And you're, you know, what you're saying now feels to me like, let's just get some students. Let's just, you know, siphon some students off here. And I don't know where we're going to wind up, but I think it's time to talk to the people who live there, work there, own property, and have businesses there. And so that would be my suggestion is just have a, a next step in our planning process, which is to talk to people most directly affected. Uh, Janet, um, you know, we hold these hearings, we hold these meetings, they're advertised, everybody's invited. And so- But nobody knows we're doing this. Like, do, you, do the property owners know this? Does the Arbors know this? Do the, you know, like let's, this is planning. I mean- We get people how do you that pay attention. Them? But this is not, I mean, a normal planning process is to contact the people who live there, work their own, and the developers. I don't know how we always skip over this process, which my husband calls Planning 101, who has a planning degree. And it's just, let's just, let's just take our ideas. We have two visions that are very similar but different and just see what people think. And then that will give us a better sense of what we should, how we should go forward. And also build some unity and, and, and community in the process because you got to pass it, whatever it is. Okay, Bruce. Um, I, uh, Nate, I substantially agree with everything you've put down, except that uh, the only point uh, you know, uh, that I would challenge, as I think, uh, as Janet said, uh, I'm probably one of those that feels that we should uh, um, strive for maintaining an, ex an extending street uh, uh, vitality and so forth. So far, I think that some portion of the lower floors needs to be commercial. But I don't, uh, I, I did, uh, uh, you know, I thought through parking and various other things because I wanted to see what the impacts would be if we had any uh, parking requirements. And clearly even a small parking requirement generates a fair amount of space uh, for parking. So, uh, and, and and I listening to Barry's presentation as I did to the ZBA for his variance request, uh, it seemed that it was reasonable to uh, put that in the hands of the developer in this particular instance. 
I really support the notion that we should uh, this should be focused for student uh, accommodations. I think that seems to be the principal thing I learned from the six or eight discussions I've had with people from other towns like us, uh, that uh, this was one of the ways in which uh, their the problems were being uh, addressed, their, their problems being very similar to ours. So yes, we should uh, describe a, a target of accommodation. Yes, I think it should be focused on students. Yes, to most everything else on your list about uh, how that happens in terms of achieving density in this in this particular place. But I think we should give, uh, I think, uh, higher priority than you are giving to uh, maintaining street vitality. And I think that's simply a matter of, of uh, encouraging in whatever way we can uh, commercial activity on the front of the ground floors. So I don't think we're very far apart if we're apart at all. Uh, as far as uh, Janet's, uh, ordinarily I would agree with Janet on this uh, idea that we need to uh, talk to the neighborhood. But what I've uh, thought about in recent years as we've been doing Zooms and so forth, um, I know when we were doing the uh, zoning, uh, sorry, the, the comprehensive plan back in the uh, late 90s, I mean, when, when I, I was part of it and it was started, it was very difficult. You had to work really hard to get uh, people to come to uh, these kind of meetings that you're advocating, Janet. And uh, typically what happened was that 80% of the people that came to the meetings were the people that you'd already been talking to. And you got a, you got a, you got a handful of folks who, for him, it was a new experience. Nowadays that we have Zoom and so forth, we would do this by Zoom probably anyway, because it's so much easier. And I agree with Doug, you know, that this is... Uh, um, there's not a whole lot of difference between doing a public meeting and there's no difference between doing a public meeting for this project and 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 having an agenda item on our on our uh, regular meeting except perhaps possibly we would uh, do a, a little bit more work to solicit uh, solicitate uh, solicit attendance and perhaps we could promise that there would be a uh, uh, a greater fraction of the meeting given to public uh, comment. Uh, I don't know. So already we give a pretty good fraction. So I don't see that as being a big deal either. So I think that we should manage our public comment and our public engagement process through the uh, through the mechanism that we already have, and uh, and and certainly make do our best to get uh, folks in. Um, I always found that it was difficult to get property uh, owners because for whatever reasons of their own, they, they didn't want to be part of a public group. And so you really have to talk to them independently as far as I can tell. So that's a beer on a Friday uh, with folks. Um, but uh, 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 Nate, I'm, I'm, I'm with you in, 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 in uh, what you lay down with that single slight uh, change of emphasis. So yeah, if I could just respond quickly, Doug. I um, yeah. I still think we should require at least thirty percent, you know, non-residential as we do in other parts of town, and maybe it's even a little bit more, uh, and have some requirements in terms of how it faces the street. And so I'm not saying abandoning, say, um, some minimum for mixed-use buildings. And you know, at one point I was saying let's just call this student housing, but I still think we would just call it mixed-use buildings or apartments, and not, you know, it can be for non-students too. It's just that I think the market will lean heavily, and so. I'm not sure I'm ready to say, well, let's just qualify it as like, you know, we have a use category in the bylaw as, you know, a, a social dormitory. But, um, you know, just knowing that, you know, I also like the idea of still making that Western access road the pedestrian way. And so I think it's really important to maintain those street trees, try to have an off-road um, pedestrian walkway uh, that's, you know, eight to 10 plus feet wide. You know, right now there's like a two to three foot sidewalk right along the Western um, curb and it's falling apart. I think we should abandon that and have a wider green strip. And so, you know, I'm not saying let's, you know, have seven story buildings here and just like this monolith. I think that, you know, we could still have some requirements and even some design standards, but, you know, we kind of rethink some of um, some of the things we have in the overlay in terms of our standards and conditions. And so, yeah, I mean, I just don't want to, you know, like, like I said, I wasn't saying let's just say no to mixed use or some requirement. I still think we should have some. Uh, and I think that, you know, someone who knows that will come in and, and make it work. I think I just think 50 percent might be too high because if it's required of every building and we it has to be it can't be parking or something, then, you know, the concern would be 
is it vacant space or will they actually work to fill it? Or is it okay if it's vacant for a long time because eventually there'll be enough people that they'll fill it anyways. And so, but I just don't want it to be so high that it becomes a deterrent or something that, you know, works against everything else in the in the overlay or in the zoning, so. All right, thanks, Nate. Um, to one sidebar, um, Pam, would you make me a co-host? Yes. All right, Sorry. and then, um, you know, we're, and then I guess I just wanna remind people that we're the first step on the process. Whatever we do goes to town council, it, they probably refer it to CRC, it goes back to town council, and then it comes to us for actual hearing. Um, so there are, we're just the first step in what we're talking about now. And to get through that whole thing, there's multiple hearings, there's probably, you know, the Gazette would certainly pick it up at one or more steps. And I think, um, you know, people would hear about it. And, um, you know, Janet, if you want to take the time to, to talk to people at the Arbors or whatever and say, hey, we're having these meetings, uh, you know, go for it. Um, you know, I, but I think in terms of using our staff resources wisely, I don't think that's a real good use at this point. So I, I know your hand's up, Janet, and then we'll get to you in a minute. Uh, Jesse, you are next. Thanks. Um, thanks, Nate, for framing the conversation that way. I, I, yeah, I think I, for the most part, totally agree, um, especially with what Doug said. I think we should try and just get to a place a little more quickly where we can move it on to the next step. Um, so I think I do agree that developers should drive what happens there. My, my two reservations are, this came up in our first discussion about this, making sure or doing what we can to make sure it's a part of town that Student residents will still benefit from also, and that to me is about the commercial space and the some of the design standards, and but but just reducing I think is totally fine, and it could still accomplish that. I just think it'd be a real shame if we eliminate all that, which is not what you're saying, and it really just became nothing but apartments and not useful for the rest of us as well. I, I do think there's a middle ground there somewhere. Okay, thanks, thanks, Jesse, Johanna. Thank you very much. I am so glad that we are coming back to this project. Um, I think the longer we wait, the more we end up feeling cornered on other things, whether it's Fearing Street or South Whitney Street as a town, the longer we have tax revenue problems. So I'm really glad we're coming back to this. And I am really interested in actually having a timetable for action on this because you know i think we started almost a year ago now in our conversation about housing we reduced that to this i think we're you know we're close and i think um i think we should come up with a timetable to get it to the next step and get it to the the town council um nate i appreciate your focus about like, okay, really part of why we ended up at University Drive is this is a spot where we kind of broadly agreed that we want to add density. I can't remember where we ended up on four stories versus five stories or, you know, whether there's a step back approach. Um, I'll just go on record saying again, I think five stories makes a lot of sense if what we're primarily trying to do is add density. And then even if all of the housing generated here is student housing. I think it'll deliver significant benefits to year round residents, both from reducing pressure on the existing neighborhoods and from the increased tax revenue. Um, I am a little bit agnostic on the like apartments versus mixed use. I think um, having some apartments in the center of the block could make sense, but I think mixed use is really nice around the intersections. Um, so that is one thought that I'll share if we are thinking about making adjustments there. And then, yeah, all four no parking requirements personally. If uh, developers think that they can create housing and have people live in their car free and that they can rent those units, that just seems like a net benefit for people on the planet. 
that's what I got. Okay, thanks, Johanna. Um, Nate, are you? Is your hand up to respond to some of these things? Uh, I mean, generally, I was going to just say that, um, uh, you know, as Janet was talking uh, previously, I mentioned that you know, and and I brought up the other neighborhoods, you know, say Fearing, North Whitney, you know, in the comprehensive housing market study, mentioned that if you upzone some areas, maybe you become more restrictive in other areas. And they mentioned a number of communities that balance that approach. And so, you know, I, I'm, I, you know, we haven't necessarily discussed it as a planning board or staff, but I, you know, I've often thought that, especially with the conversations that are happening around town, we have the additional lot area per family, but, you know, it could just be that we have a, a, a more uh, prescriptive formula that says, you know, this many units here and, um, you know, with some, some kind of massing uh, standards so that, you know, even if you own a big lot in RG, you know, you can't just try to get 10 units, right? Because it seems like that's not what people want, right? You really, you know, it seems like the worry is that our zoning could be flexible enough that the actual streetscape and character of a number of neighborhoods could be really changed. And I think some of it is we, there, we don't have certain standards, the lots and the properties we have weren't developed on a grid system, you know? So, you know, certain like St. Paul and in California, I found where they actually have you know, standards in terms of directionality of the units and how they have to be placed on the lot and, and the driveway and certain things. But we just, I feel like we weren't developed in that way. But I do think that if, you know, we're moving forward with University Drive, I think there could be some other considerations for zoning. Um, and I think it's like a whole suite of things. I'm not saying we're going to try to propose five different housing amendments right now, but I think, you know, part of the conversation can be, okay, well, if we're, you know, if we're looking at a few areas in town and talking things, what are some other corollary amendments that we could be also considering. And so, I mean, it goes kind of to the other, the next agenda item, kind of the housing issues in general. And the housing trust has been talking about this too, really about, you know, what's appropriate, how do we move forward? They're talking about their goals and how many affordable units in the next so many years. And they're really pushing, they wanna push for say at least 200 affordable units in the next five years. Uh, and then there's also market rate units. And so, you know, I, I mean, I'm kind of thinking, well, if this is just apartments on University Drive, does inclusionary zoning apply? Do we increase the percentage or not? And so, I mean, those are like some details that still need to be worked out, but I think that, you know, there are many pieces to this um, and University Drive is one of them for this housing discussion. All right. Uh, I will note that we're just a little past eight o'clock and we usually take a break. Uh, so maybe Janet and Karen will hear from you and then we'll take a five minute break. Janet. Could Karen go first? because I've already talked, she hasn't. I just, I, I really agree with Joanna and, and you, Nate, and I'm wondering how we can move forward most quickly. And I'm thinking maybe the best thing is to put down, that, that you, for example, uh, put down a few things that we can discuss specifically and move on, such as are we going to limit to four or five stories? That would be the first thing. And then the parking thing, are we going to leave it up to the developers? Just put get specific so that we can really uh, move forward. All right. Thanks, Karen. Janet? So I, I, I do think we could do a simple thing like email and mail, do a mailing um, using the materials that Nate have, may, maybe make them a little bit um, more like, you may not know, you know, because you don't look at the planning board agenda every every other week. Um, this is what we're talking about. We'd love your ideas, email them back, come to our next meeting that we're going to talk about it. Um, I think, you know, if nobody shows up, okay, then then we've done our due diligence on the other hand, we're spending $100,000 in two years tweaking design standards in downtown Amherst, which frankly, we could actually pull out of the Northampton book or the Dennis book or the Somerville book. They're all done. You know, Rhode Island has a design standards things. We could have just done that and said, hey, we like these design standards. Let's give them to town council. But instead, we're spending two years talking to people. So I don't understand how you can say, we, we, we've spending all this money and time on this process. And then, by the way, there's this huge area of town, you know, nobody really, you know, like, let's just get something done. So I do think it wouldn't be hard to do some outreach and mailing, emailing and contacts. And so 
I literally, you know, we can, if Nate would do a, maybe a, a more of a summary or I could work on it, I would literally lick envelopes. I don't, I don't understand this strange. I mean, I've just watched in town meeting time and time again, where proposals come to people, they haven't seen them. They haven't responded them. They have information that we all need to know and it just hits the wall. And so I think we're really close in terms of agreement. I think that we want to see density students or not. Um, you know, I think, you know, the na people in the neighborhoods are crying for less density and more control over what's happening in terms of students, um, you know, too much student housing and things like that. But I do really think it could be a simple step just to talk to our community and kind of build community in that conversation. And the developers don't have to show up in a meeting and they don't, they don't like that, but they could send comments anonymously, you know, and just say, hey, this is what I need. This is what works. This is why we think this parking is needed. We'd like to decide by ourselves because we're developers. And we could say as a planning board, like, okay, go for it. Or no, we'd like to talk to you about that to make sure it doesn't become a place where nobody can park. So they wind up parking everywhere. So I just, I would really urge, I mean, I would, that we just consider involving our community in especially people who work their own property, um, run businesses, live there. Um, it's it just seems like to, I don't know to me it's so fundamental that it seems presumptuous that you don't involve people in key decisions that affect their lives. Okay, um, I guess before we break, Nate, I'll just say I agree with Car, and that maybe the best thing to do is for you to put something together based on your perception of what might be used. And you've heard the comments from the board this evening and earlier. Uh, and, you know, give us something concrete and we'll, you know, try to make some decisions and, but keep it viable. You know, and I, I, so, yeah, and I mean, that's what I was hoping from this conversation, you know, to go back with Chris and Rob Mora and staff and put pen to paper and say, okay, here's, here's another draft. And let's, you know, as Doug said, there'll, there'll be many chances to amend it and change it, but at least, you know, here's something, if the planning board wants to move it forward, we can, and then that kind of starts the process. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, Janet's interesting about the outreach. I'm, um, you know, there's, we talked to a few stakeholders, I think it could be better. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think this could be a, a big change. I don't want to, um, I, you know, I want, you know, I think what the, the important thing with Dodson and downtown, you know, they really like consensus. And so at least with that project, you know, there, we, we really want a lot of input. And some of it is the BG district. It's not that they're designing just for the BG district. It's like, okay, where else could the downtown be? Is it in transitional zones? Is it BL? Is it residential? Uh, this overlay is pretty uh, defined, you know, uh, right now. That's not saying we wouldn't reach out to property owners, but it's not as if we're trying to say, well, let's creep up. Um, too many areas. The board kind of already outlined this area, which I'm staying within, you know, Route 9 to Amity uh, properties on either side of the street. But I think Dodson, we're really hoping that they will investigate and assess an area that's bigger than BG because, you know, where you, we want their expertise on saying, well, what could happen north of Triangle and how far north does that go based on conversations with different stakeholders and people and what does the community think? Um, so anyways, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think once I, we, once I get pen to paper, the next time this comes back, I hope it's something that the board can then really discuss. And then, you know, maybe, maybe at that point, it's actually, you know, ready to be presented to council or to property owners and a bit more people. Okay. Janet, one more word before we break. So Nate, I'd be happy to work with you on that, but I don't want to work on, because I think what you're writing is really clear and really, you know, it's really pointing out the issues of difference and things like that. I'd be happy to work on something that's maybe shorter, but I don't want to do it if there's no pu public process. If we're going to say as a planning board, like we're not really going to talk to any of the stakeholders because we want to get moving, then we can do that. But I really do think this could be a night, uh, just an opportunity to reach out people, get them involved, get their ideas and get them informed. And, you know, it's their town, but I'd, I'd love to work with you, but I don't want to do it if it's, if the board doesn't think it's important and it's fine just to proceed without public involvement or outreach. Thank you, Janet. Bruce, and then Chris. Uh, Janet, I have to say that 
uh, you can't say that there's no public process. I absolutely refute that. I, I, I think it's um, it's disingenuous to represent this as having no public process. I think we definitely have a public process, and this is it. And uh, and we've had uh, a number of these meetings, and they've always been public, and we've taken public comment. We have a public process. Now, I will discuss with you how we could sharpen that process, but I think it's it's just not right to say that we have no public process and to let that get out and for people to imagine that that's true because it's not true. We do have a public process and I think it's important that we respect that and I think it's also important that we understand that the ad, the, 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 the era of Zoom has made it uh, an order of magnitude uh, more flexible, more useful, more uh, uh, all-embracing. Yes, I'm sure we can do better in how we can focus it, but that's where I think we should be. That's how we should characterize it. Please, let's do it that way. All right, Chris. I just wanted to say that we could put a um, public uh, public release, what do you call it, press release out about this. Um, we could say that we're going to discuss this on a certain day in town hall, in town um, planning board meeting. And... Um, you know, just put it in the paper. And I don't think right now, certainly, we don't have the capacity to be, you know, creating lengthy email lists or sending out a lot of um, mailings. You know, the planning board is real. the planning department is really strapped. We just lost another planner, even though we now have a, a planner, but another one left. So we are not in a position to do a lot of extra work, but putting together a press release about planning board is going to talk about this topic on X date at X time. If you want to come and talk or listen, fine, that would be easy to do. So I'm, I'm happy to do that. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's take a five minute break. We can continue this topic when we come back. I will at least ask for public comment from the few members of the public who are attending. And so the time now is 8.15. Take five minutes, come back at 8.20, and at least turn on your camera and let us know you're back when you return. Thank you.
All right, time is 821. Please turn on your camera if you are back. Does anybody have the Celtic score? It's close. Oh no. Wait, guys, what's the score? 5148. How can this be? Oh, sorry, but it's not live. We're watching it on delay. Or they're watching it on delay. I'm sitting in the office on the planning board <laughs> meeting. How could, they, how could this be close? All right. It looks like we've got all the board members back. Let's see if we can get Nate back for the last few comments for tonight on this topic. I will, I would like to let the folks who are listening in as attendees in the public, uh, my next request will be uh, an invitation to, for you guys to make public comment if you wanna make one. Okay, it looks like Nate's back, we're all back. So I see three people in the uh, public as attendees. Do any of you want to make a public comment? Okay, Janet, Janet Keller, you raised your hand. Yes, okay. Pam, could you bring Janet over and prepare the timer? Hello, Janet, please give us your name and remind us of your street address. Welcome. Sure. Thank you. Janet Keller, um, uh, 120 Pulpit Hill Road in North Amherst. I very much appreciate this, all the previous discussions that the planning board has had and the work that Nate has done. Um, and I would like to put a plug in for in enhancing the outreach. Um, I don't know how much more work it is for the staff to do an in-person meeting as well as a Zoom meeting, um, but um, I would very much welcome that. And um, I know some people are interested in this, but have um, been too busy to participate. Um, so I hope you would consider that um, um, and uh, have Nate's latest presentation. And um, that's basically it. Um, I, 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 think, I, I think people are extremely busy um, and with more outreach through the, the Gazette and um, offering an in-person meeting. Um, I ho hope it would not be too burdensome, but offer a chance to hear the public. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Anybody else want to say anything? Okay. All right, uh, let's see, we left before the break. Uh, I think we we had talked, Nate, about sort of charging you to go back and do a, do a draft based on your best uh, understanding of what the market would respond to and keeping in mind the concerns that the board has had. So, is there anything else we want to say about this particular topic tonight? No, thanks everyone for the discussion. And, you know, as always, if you have any comments after the meeting you can email them to staff. So I think, I think it's been helpful. Okay, thank you. All right, so it's not a whole huge change of topic, but we'll go to the next items listed here, uh, housing issues discussion. And um, so first we have listed Janet's ideas, then we have Karen's letter, and then we have, uh, I think it was from Jesse to a conversation about whether a housing subcommittee 
of this group would be useful. So uh, why don't we start with Janet's ideas and um, Janet, is there, is, do you want to introduce this or should we have Chris or somebody else introduce it? Um, I actually, my idea was just to continue talking about housing issues. Um, so I, you know, basically, you know, I know Bruce was doing research and um, I also know Bruce is in his retirement become an Uber volunteer of many, <laughs> many boards and um, building projects. Um, and I don't think the burden should be on him to continue his research and coming up with, you know, different, you know, contacting different planning directors or what, you know, what's worked in university towns. Um, and then I think it'd be great. So I just think that um, we need some way to continue that work. Um, mm -hmm. I also think, you know, sort of, I think it, I think that from what we've been seeing and hearing is one of our goals should be in the housing is to stabilize neighborhoods. And I, it's just, Neighbor, you know, there are houses, there are neighborhoods in town that are under pressure and changing. And, you know, I just think that we need to continue that master plan vision of a mix of people economically, where they are in life, you know, ethnicity, um, opportunities for, you know, young families or single people to, to live in neighborhoods. And, you know, we have people who are older who want to stay in their neighborhoods and because of changing circumstances in terms of the market and student housing feel driven out of neighborhoods. And so I think my goal was just to put it back on the agenda again and talk a little more holistically. So I'm super happy just to go on to Karen's letter or, you know, the okay. idea of a housing subcommittee. Okay. Well, um, you know, we had the, the multiple in-person meetings last year and, um, you know, we could resume those in person. Uh, we could, uh, just agree that we're going to have a housing conversation on the agenda every one of these meetings. And then we can talk about Jesse's suggestion of a, of a separate housing subcommittee as well. Um, Jesse, you have your hand up. Do you want to talk about that already? Yeah, if you don't mind, just because it's... Yeah, so I think it, it's pretty related. <laughs> So the, the reason I asked to bring that up was basically what you two both just said, which was we had a couple of meetings almost a year ago to discuss um, the rental pressures in certain neighborhoods and if there's any planning we could do about it. And then we haven't really got back to it. And so I would really be interested in, in helping that conversation and any kind of recommendations we're going to make to town council or to the full planning board to to move a little quicker, mm -hmm. right? I, I got pretty transparent. Part of the reason I got involved with playing board was to try and address some of these issues that many of us in town are feeling urgency about. And so I would just be happy to be involved in that effort, completely respecting town staff's time. Um, I would wanna do it in a way to minimize extra work. And so I don't know what the actual rules are about that, but uh, I wanna make that clear that 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 should be a priority also. I understand how strapped you all are and don't want to just add more. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, the idea was to make a subcommittee that could really focus on a lot of the work that Bruce has done and just bringing recommendations rather than just conversations. Okay. Uh, Nate. Yeah, the trust is going through kind of an action planning process right now. <clears throat> and it's interesting, they, you know, they might have three, they, right now they're kind of focusing on three main uh, goals and one might be housing production, uh, you know, funding, uh, you know, uh, fundraising and, you know, say public uh, outreach and certain things. Um, but, you know, they're not as familiar with zoning and, and regulations and say some of the things that the plane board members and the research Bruce has been doing. And so I think when they look at housing, it's from a different perspective than board members. And so, you know, I, what I see this happening, it could be that if there's a subcommittee or the plane board discusses it, you know, it's picking up the comprehensive housing policy from that the town uh, council adopted a few years ago, the, the studies we have and say, okay, well, if the trust is looking at generically kind of production, you know, what are the things we might talk about? Is it, you know, certain measures in residential neighborhoods, you know, what does that mean? And so, you know, they're, uh, they're you know, they're complementary conversations. And so, um, 
I, I think it could be beneficial and every once in a while bring them back. Uh, two quick other things. The housing trust has uh, been discussing, you know, what they would provide to the town manager's office in conversations with UMass. And so, you know, they formulated a list of questions or things they'd like to have, whether initially it's like some data collection and then I don't, who knows where it'll progress from there. But, you know, as the town manager's office said, they, they're kind of the conduit to UMass. And so the trust is trying to use that. Uh, and the other one is we're hoping by next week to have a consultant under contract uh, to start a new housing production plan. And so that'll be an eight month process to really get updated information about, you know, the housing um, characteristics in town, demographic information, and then kind of the need for affordable housing and kind of actually a range of income levels from extremely low income up to, you know, 150% or 200% of AMI and the, you know, the capital A and lowercase a affordable. And so we're hoping um, uh, we get some responses that are due next week and we can quickly move on that. But that, you know, that could also be part of, you know, I think it'll really lend itself to this kind of conversation um, later this year. Okay. Bruce? Janet and others have mentioned this uh, calling around that I've been doing and so forth. And I guess I want to be clear that this was done for my benefit. Uh, I never promised that uh, I would. Uh, it was done for my benefit to be a better member of this board, that's for sure. But it, it was entirely uh, kind of orchestrated by me, and I didn't feel that I needed to relate to anybody else on this. It was just me trying to be understand the issues that I felt were going to were, were crashing down on us, particularly after the 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 uh, the out of left field uh, uh, proposal that came from uh, Mary uh, Mandy Joe and Pat uh, Giangelis. Um However, um, since it is you have obviously been aware of what I've been trying to do and what I have done and what I've set out to do and haven't yet fully completed for quite a while, would it be uh, helpful or would it be even appropriate if I was just to send you the nested group of files, uh, folders, in fact, that I have. I Basically, it is uh, a nested group of about 15 folders for each of the towns that I identified. And some of them have got little in them. Some of them have got the master plans and various things from those towns, housing studies and stuff that I read or intend to read. And others of them have, uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, reports from conversations with maybe the planning director and uh, others. So but I'd be happy to share that if it was useful. I hadn't thought it would be useful, but I I confess that I made that uh, tentative judgment myself. So I thought, well, if anybody would be interested in, in having this bundle of stuff that I've got, I'd be happy to uh, share it. I think it's probably fairly large uh, uh, from, a, from a digital point of view, but I could probably figure out a way of putting it on Dropbox or something like that and getting it around. Would that be helpful? Is that is that even appropriate? Um, I mean, I'm allowed to do so that. Let me let me start by just asking Chris, um, what are the rules around circulation of information around on the planning board? Do they, does it, I mean, if Bruce wants to share it with Jesse, that's fine. But if Bruce wants to share it with half or three quarters of the board, is there any issue with open meeting or public, you know? He should share it with us, our staff, and then we can put it in a place or distribute it. Um, I think, you know, sharing it with one other member probably is okay, but um, I wouldn't go any farther than that. And so if, Bruce wanted to give it to us, we could find a place on the website to put it, and then everybody could um, have access to it, and um, that might be the way to do it. And Pam would have to help out with that, and maybe Nate as well. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, information sharing isn't a violation of open meetings, so you can share anything. I think the concern would be if in the notes or somewhere there's uh, recommendations or Bruce's opinions, and then board members start you know, working on a document online that isn't public, then there, there, that that becomes a risk, right? So, um, but I think you know, we through we don't we can't use Dropbox in the town anymore just because of security reasons. So we use a uh, OneDrive or shared folder, but we could set that up. I don't think that's a problem at all. Um, but I there shouldn't be email flying back and forth yeah. among planning board members. 
It should come to a central repository and we'll put it somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think I could set up a shared folder, Bruce, where we you could have access and download everything and it becomes really easy uh, then to share that. Um, and then, you know, to me, it's, you know, the local historic district study committee, you know, I had this with uh, discussion with the, t with the state and the town clerk about how much can you share on a shared folder? And really it's just, you know, any information is fine once it becomes kind of a, say a working document or something that the committee or board will discuss or vote on, then it becomes a possible violation. So information sharing only is fine to have kind of the shared folder. This is pretty yes. clearly uh, information. I, I was nothing opinionated. It's right. it's and purely can, data and documentation. And you can you can set it just for viewing and downloading and not have editing allowed. So nobody's working together on a common document. So I'm um, looking at a something I got. Um, excuse me from KP Law. It says ideas, feelings, beliefs, and concerns should not be shared, but documents can be shared. Okay. And Bruce, I, I actually envisioned that at some point we'd get a kind of 10 to 15 minute report from you. Here's what I found, you know, anything that was a common issue that towns had or common solutions that seemed to work. Um, but if, if, you, if that really is not where you ended up, that's fine. So quickly, I'll jump in. I think sharing would be helpful, Bruce. As the consultant gets on with the housing production plan, we went beyond just the general scope that the state requires and asked that they do a more in-depth study of, say, student impacts to the Amherst housing market and, you know, looking at comparable communities. So, you know, we could take some of the information you've already done and provide it to the consultant and say, here, can you look at these three communities as, you know, uh, comparables or something? And so, you know, I'd appreciate it you know, just even for that purpose, um, because I think it's, you know, you've, you've kind of already done some of that initial assessment and research. And I think we might as well use it to, you know, leverage it with whoever we can. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, Chris, uh, categorically, there's none of those KP law adjectives in there. It's uh, simply a, a, a bin of, uh, of, of material. Uh, secondly, um, uh, Doug, I'd be happy to put something together. I think it's, it's be just on the basis of what's there. I had hoped I would do more, but but what with the uh, added uh, appointment to the uh, elementary school building committee, and which I I just spent about twenty or twenty five hours reviewing five thousand pages of documents. It's just astonishing how many pages of documents are in construction drawings these days, and, and a few other things as well. But and thirdly, I'm. I, I'm probably I could be a little embarrassed about how sloppy and and personal this uh, this 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 thing is, uh, but I'm going to I'm going to um, bag that and just uh, give it to you, Nate, as it is. I'll continue to add my stuff to it uh, to my pile. I probably uh, and so forth, so it, it might get updated and so forth. But I'll if you send me if you send me some, uh, I'll, I'll deal with you in order to. Uh, just to get you the pile of stuff that I've got, and uh, and, and uh, I'll perhaps write a, a README file or something, just help people understand the structure of it and and, and make it a little more sensible. I I I, uh, I want to manage expectations around this. It's uh, it's this is not really set up for prime time, but I'll regard you folks as not prime time. <laughs> Okay, thank you. All right, so we'll go on to Jesse. I was just going to say thanks, Bruce. That's very generous. Um, as long as happy to have you share those, and so we can see it. As long as it does not stop you from using sharing what's in your brain that you learn from all of that as well. So hopefully you'll continue to be part of the conversation as well. All right, uh, Janet. Well, I think. Um... In a way, that whole talk about what we can see and share in terms of, you know, we can always share information with each other, right? Um, but not, you know, the beliefs, ideas, feelings, and concerns. And I think that kind of supports the idea for perhaps for the um, a housing subcommittee where we could sit down and look or members could look at what Bruce has investigated saying, hey, we need more research. Um, 
for, I think there's been those, you know, international university meetings, like let's get the minutes of those because those were super useful. Here comes my colleague. Um, and, <laughs> and um, you know, and have a discussion about like what looked like good ideas, what we should maybe look at further, bring back to the planning board, you know, here's what Boulder is doing or here's what, you know, UNH did. You know, we talked to the planning director, Bruce did, it looks like a viable thing. Should we look into this idea more? And, you know, kind of working more intensively without adding to staff time. And it's hard for us to discuss stuff during planning board meetings because there's so much stuff that comes up. And so I do think it'd be good to have a committee just focusing on, you know, housing issues and, you know, answers that will fit Amherst, you know, and, you know, anyway, so I do, I do think this is a really good idea. And I'd be interested in like Jesse's thoughts on like who should be on it. Cause I was thinking maybe the a person from the housing trust or somebody like John, John Hornick, who was on the housing trust, who has a vast, res, you know, knows a ton and stuff like that would be good to have an ad. Uh, Chris. Yeah, so I think we'd have to think carefully about this because if it's um, if it's just members of the planning board, then the planning board can designate those members as a subcommittee. But if you start including other people and you call it a subcommittee, it's not really a subcommittee anymore, it's something else. And I think perhaps the town manager might need to get involved because he's the one who appoints members of multi-member bodies. Um, the other thing is that we're stretched pretty thin right now as far as um, supporting Zoom meetings. So if you were to meet in person, you know, and you were to um, take your own minutes and publish your own minutes and send us an agenda that we could post, but if we didn't have to actually be at the meeting, that would be doable. Um, so, if, you know, we need to think about some of these logistics, but I think it's doable, but I don't think that the planning board, planning staff can participate a lot in this right now. Okay. Um, Jesse. Yeah, thanks, Chris. That, that, that all sounds reasonable to me as well. And if that doesn't require a lot of work from you that I feel like we could totally do that in person, take our own minutes. Um, question about something you just said. So if it's three or four or whoever wants to be part of it from the planning board, I'm assuming it can run similarly that other people can attend and participate, just not be appointed to the subcommittee. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So uh, Chris? I said yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So I guess one other or one, maybe the next question from my perspective is, how many members of the board would be interested in participating? Because if it's if it ends up being basically all the members, maybe we should just have a fifth Wednesday meeting every month of the board, um, where somebody takes minutes and there's an agenda, and um, Chris and Pam don't have to run it. So. Uh, Raise your hand if you'd be interested in being on a housing subcommittee uh, group, I guess. So we have, uh, I see Fred and Karen and Jesse and Bruce, um, not Janet and not Johanna. Is that, if I got that right? So I, I'm actually, my term is ending at the end of June. So I could be a very short-lived member, <laughs> but as is mine. So I'm very, I'm very interested, but I, I don't see it as you know being that helpful right at this moment. Okay. All right, um, Johanna, uh, you raised your hand. Is that? Go ahead. I guess and tell I just us what... I wanted to make a comment. I mean, I'm interested in the housing issues um but i think i don't know maybe i'm mischaracterizing the process we went through with our in-person meetings but i feel like we you know came up with a rubric identified some areas of town and i'm a little bit interested i guess i'm more interested in let's 
get university drive done and then let's move on to the next area that we've identified as kind of being ripe for rezoning and so the idea of a subcommittee to do you know another round of information gathering when i think we have a lot of really good information historic information and expertise that we can already draw one to me feels process heavy at a time when we need action okay uh jesse uh yes i think i feel the same and so i did i think i was envisioning a subcommittee as trying to make some action recommendations rather than um doing that same thing over i totally agree uh it, and that just doesn't seem to be space on regular planning board agenda very often to come back to the some of those other ideas and so rather than do sequential i'd like to attack things in parallel right so that's what i'm thinking about so on the topic of our of our agenda chris how does our agenda look over the next say two months are we pretty heavily booked or could we in fact have conversations at least once a month you know at least one of our two meetings each month have a substantive say one hour conversation I think that is doable. Um, what we have coming up is we're not going to hold a meeting on May 29th, as far as I know. I don't think we've, we didn't have time to advertise anything. Um, we're having um, two site plan review meetings on June 5th, but they're not heavy lifts. One is a community home uh, for disabled people, and another one is Amherst College Fields doing some things on their fields. Um, so yeah, June 5th, it seems like you could spend at least an hour talking about this topic. And then um, I don't, we we do have a couple of big ones coming up. Like we have um, the Barry Roberts project at the corner of Amity and University Drive. I've understood that that is imminent as far as they're submitting something. So um, that's going to take, you know, at least an hour to hear a presentation. And my guess is you'll probably continue that public hearing that might come on June 26th. But other than that, I'm not aware of anything big, but maybe Nate is. All right. Um, Nate, did do you want to comment before we go to Karen? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, um, to me, I, I see the advantage of a subcommittee in that they could meet, you know, every week if they wanted. I could set up the Zoom meetings, hand it over to someone to host it. I'd jump off after five minutes um, and the advantage there is it could be, you know, two, four, whatever number of members, and they can really uh, discuss an issue in depth and then bring it back to the planning board at those one hour sessions. I think just one hour a month may not progress something. Um, and then it always seems like we end up getting a hearing. And so even on the next meeting, we say, oh, we have two site plan reviews, but you know, that's, that's like, that could be three hours, you know, even if it's simple, right? It's just, it takes time to go through everything. And so I would just, I don't, I think it's, you know, we're the trust is we have um, one sub subcommittee of the trust right now, and it's been pretty manageable again, because uh, staff, you know, we'll set up the zoom meeting, but I'm not there necessarily. We don't take minutes. Uh, we can help post the agenda. It's pretty quick. Um, and so, you know, I think that structure, it works and still have, you know, try to have, you know, an hour once a month to talk about it where the subcommittee would report back and there'd be a little bit more of a discussion. Uh, you know, like I said, Shrewsbury Road Solar, Wayfinders, Comprehensive Permit may be coming this summer. Uh, I think there's like four site plan reviews, two coming, two in the wings. And so to me, that right there is, you know, that's four or five meetings of uh, pretty, pretty full stuff. Um, okay. All right. Um... So may I say something? Yeah. So this, this would mean that... Um, Committee members, and I think we listed them. I can't remember who they are. Karen, Jesse, um, Bruce, and Fred um, would make up an agenda and send it to Nate, and he would post it. And then um, you would also take your minutes and write them up and send them to Nate, and he would post them. And that's all that staff would have to do other than setting up the Zoom meeting. And then you would report to um, the planning board at regular meetings about what you discussed. Is that, am I getting this right? 
and you would uh, then you wouldn't have to meet in person if Nate's willing to set up the Zoom meeting. I think that could work. Okay. So, Jesse, do you want to? I mean, does this sound? Yeah. Sound <clears throat> yeah, good? it sounds great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, would uh, Chris? I assume we would need to have a some sort of vote to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, or to appoint a, to to create a subcommittee and appoint uh, some members to it. Yes. Okay. All right. Before we do that, Janet, you've got your hand up. I was actually going to make a motion that we take the idea as described by Chris and vote on it. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if that's quite proper, but I, I was just thinking that sounds like a great motion. So, but I don't have to make it. Are we ready to vote? Do Go we... ahead and make it. I make a motion to start a housing subcommittee of the planning board with the activities as outlined by Chris. And members consisting of Fred, Jesse, Karen, and Bruce. And yes. With other members. Free to come. Free to come. <laughs> <laughs> free to visit. <laughs> right. All right. Um, is that, is that anybody want to second that? Uh, Bruce, I see two, several fingers raised. Bruce, I think I saw yours first, Jesse. Uh, what did that mean, Bruce? That meant to uh, take Jesse, but I realized no one knows where Jesse is on my screen. So oh, okay. I suggest yeah, Jesse second the motion he's, since he's, he's been. Okay. Associated. I second the motion. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, all right. Any further discussion before we have a vote? All right. Um, we'll go ahead, starting with Bruce. I approve. And Fred. I approve. And Jesse. I approve. Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And Karen. Karen? Click the wrong thing. I. Okay. Thank you. All right. And uh, I'm an I, I guess. Yep. So that's seven in favor and no abstentions and no opposition. All right. So uh, we'll look forward to seeing the notices of your meetings <laughs> and hearing your reports. So, so maybe I can ask offline, but how do we? How are we allowed to communicate? With you're this allowed to schedule. You're allowed to communicate and schedule things. Okay. So, so if you want to ask everybody in in that group, are you available on Wednesday at two o'clock in the afternoon? You can do that. Um, okay. I think you can also set up an agenda. You just can't discuss it. Okay. And all right. do we do we loop you or you and Nate in on all these emails as well? I think so. Yeah, just yeah. For, for our information. Yep. They can yeah. copy me and uh, yeah. I mean, you know, so yeah, we, we just you you and I can talk offline or email if you want. We can have a phone call about you know getting that set up and you know um, yeah. I don't. It's not. I think it can work pretty easily. Okay, uh, Janet. So just a little legal advice. So if you're putting together an agenda, you can say, I would like to have this on the agenda or could we put this on the agenda? Just don't say, I think this issue is really important. I would like it on the agenda because that happened to a school committee member who said that and that went up to the AG and it was an open meeting law. So, you know, I mean, obviously you think it's important. You want it on the agenda, but you just can't say that. So. All right. You've been warned. Okay, uh, so let's go on to Karen's letter. And um, Pam, maybe you could bring that up on the screen. And Karen, you can maybe give us uh, any any commentary you want to share as we get into the conversation.
So yeah, we can see your we could see your Windows Explorer there for a minute, Pam. Yeah. And it then it went away. Now it's back. Not to share. So hold on. Sorry about that. Can you see that I'm opening the folder? Yes. Okay. All right, so here you are. Sorry, All it right. took a minute. All right, great. Okay, Karen. Yeah, okay. So we we talk often about if we're going to develop um, University Drive, then maybe we have some leverage with UMass and say, look, you know, we're doing this, what are you gonna do? And I just think it's really important for us to have some sort of um, kind of formalized group, doesn't have to be planning board members only, or uh, just there should be outside people that join this group, but there should be some way to communicate directly with people at the university about how urgent it is that UMass starts addressing on their own land and, and using us to help them figure out how they can house students uh, and, and particularly on that Olympic drive, I'm thinking. Um, I know that the student government is very interested in, in helping here. I think there could be representatives from, from many different areas and that we sit down and sort of see how we can work together. Probably most urgent is, I mean, Doug has pointed out that the university would probably love to build housing, but they ha only have a certain amount of funds and they have maybe certain things that are more important to build. And so they're limited in how, how quickly they can address this issue. But maybe if we all work together, we could find a way to, to talk directly with the government and, see is there any way that they can also uh, help fund uh, help help you know us really get this thing going faster um, so that we don't have the problem that Jesse is also addressing of the town rapidly sort of losing the population that it has in the schools I see it's really urgent. There are less students enrolled all the time. And as a resident of downtown, I see uh, the dearth of little children, the, the dearth of young families that are able to live here. So I think the best thing that we can do is to sort of have some, um, some concrete group that works together and they should then work together with the university. And I just wondered if the the um, if we as a planning board want to um, support this kind of effort. That doesn't mean that we as planning board members have to be on this group, but that we are in favor of urging that a group like this of residents, of people from from housing, from planning board, from from wherever, um, see if there are members that w could meet directly and the town manager when we met with him um, and s sort of represented it as a planning board uh, issue that we meet with them he said no you're not that's not your function uh, it's my function to represent you know the town to the outside entities so I I, I heard what he said and uh, I thought that maybe this would be a way that we can address this in 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 a in a time where you know it's urgent to not waste a lot of time, so it's a little bit like Jesse saying he he joined planning board because he saw that that we're kind of in a housing crisis. This was my way of approaching it too. Um. So, I guess given what what Paul what Paul Bockelman said, are 
are you perhaps saying we should uh, we should vote to recommend to whether it's town council or the or the town manager that such a group be formed and empowered to uh, communicate with UMass? Yes. Yeah, thank you for formulating, but that's exactly what I think. Okay. Uh, Bruce. Um, I, think, I think this is a good letter, um, uh, but I don't, uh, necessarily agree i didn't quite i i it seems to me that this is a an ex, this this feels like the the beginning of a an informal committee or or, or a pressure group of of uh, people in town it it seems that it would have more relevance more appropriate more obviously the 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 the, the obvious chemistry of this from a civic process point of view is that this arises out of uh, um the people directly. I, I, I can imagine trying to create a town committee around this would uh, deaden the deaden the uh, the purity of it or the the, the 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 sharpness of it. Karen, I think you've written a good letter. I mean, I would suggest the removal of seven adjectives. Uh, I think it would be more powerful uh, because some of the adjectives are rather uh, strong, and and I think people would. Uh, reading this letter would be inclined perhaps to take exception to seven adjectives and forget everything else. Uh, and they shouldn't because it's, it's a nicely stated, uh, um, it's, it's an, it's a nice statement of the problem they were facing. Um, Bruce, so I would, just, are you just suggesting that, that Karen put it, put it in an envelope and send it to the chancellor? Uh, no, not necessarily, <laughs> although that would be one course of action, uh, but it's less likely to, to, uh, uh, I think you use this letter to, uh, excite other people and you get, uh, uh, uh an active group of folks who decide, uh, they want to do something. Um, and then maybe it's, uh, pushed into Paul's, uh, court as a, representative of the town he's he uh, in his conversations with the chancellor says you know we've got a a, a small and growing uh, group of uh, folks who are um, very concerned about certain things and and they have a right to be and they've clearly stated the problem and uh, they've clearly identified it and we need to uh, do something about this and so I think a letter like this and is used to uh, cohere a, a, a constituency, and that constituency is used to pressure the, uh, the 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 appropriate authority, which is the town manager. Um, uh, uh, that's the way I see this uh, would see this working. Um, but I also see that um, the 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 goal of this is to suggest that the university should build more housing, and I think in a wholly different uh, um, frame of mind, you would look at this and you say, well, hold on, do we really want uh, the all of the students who, who come and live here to live in a place where they don't contribute to taxes? Or is it better that we do what, you know, we have them all living on University Drive where they're contributing to the tax base of the town and therefore paying for the the emergency services, for example, that they need? So I, I don't think it's, why the straightforward, but I think it's a nice statement of the problem. And, and certainly the, the situation of the moment that is causing uh, the pressure to destabilize uh, uh, traditional and established neighborhoods is not is something we want to do something about, which is something we should be concerned about and so forth. So, but I don't think that necessarily the approach is to, to for the planning board to be press, uh, to be to put into service of persuading the, the 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 town manager to do something about this i think this is the this letter is to cohere a constituency and i think we ought to be clear about whether um how, how strongly we believe that the solution is for this for the university to build houses as for us to do it ourselves or what combination certainly there's a need that would suggest that both solutions would be appropriate but i think we have to remember that uh, 
the more students are on campus, the fewer of uh, the less their accommodation is contributing to the tax base of the town. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Um, I think the next person I think was Janet. Um, I agree with Bruce that if this became a town committee, it would just take the life out of it and it would just go to the process and the the secret, the the opaque citizen activity forms, and then it would, you know, go to the town manager and the interviews, and then it would go to town council. And I think it would die a death. Um, and maybe not. Um, but I, I do think that it it's it's like it's like a call for focusing on housing um, issues in Amherst. And, you know, there's 30,000 UMass students and they have, you know, I, I'm losing track of it. I think it's close to 15,000 um, dorm units. The students want to be on campus more um, and they don't want to be on campus in a studio apartment that is 2,400 a month that also has a problem with, um, the fire alarms going off, as I've recently heard. And so that's not affordable to people. And so it's calling for affordable campus housing on campus for students. Um, I, I, I find it hard to, I, mean, I don't think, I mean, even if they built 3000 units there's still students that will be living in Amherst, but it's kind of how to create space for different types of people to live here. And so I do think this is like a call to action. I see it sort of as an open letter to the chancellor and I think, I think we could vote as a planning board saying, yeah, we need more housing on campus. I mean, if anyone disputes that, I just find that hard to understand. We have had a student, you know, sit in on this a year ago. Um, the students want housing. We have all sorts of people in neighborhoods who really feel overwhelmed by, you know, student housing, too many students in their neighborhood. Um, I don't know. I just, I mean, the question to me is, does the planning board support this? And I think this is a very collaborative letter. It's not like pointing fingers. It's like saying, we know that UMass needs money to build this housing. We know that we need to work through our state legislators and we need to work together. I think the housing, we could ask the housing trust to sign this or a housing activist. I think this could be a very powerful letter of like, let's work together as a group, as a community to fulfill a need. And, you know, I think students would sign this and um, I don't think we'll lose revenue. You know, I think there's plenty of people who want to live in Amherst. Um, and there's a lot of tax revenue produced by people who live in their own homes. And, you know, arguably at least half the tax base is based on people who live in their own homes who really want to live in strong neighborhoods and not see this constant erosion. So I do support this letter. Um, and we can create a small committee of people working together with all these people that you've listed. I mean, I would support the planning board signing as a group to show a really st how strongly we feel about this. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Janet. Karen? <clears throat> <laughs> Karen, you are still muted. Yeah, thank you, Janet and Bruce. Yeah, my question is, how do we take a letter like this and, and make it go out there and be effective and uh, um, uh, rally people? How is it just going to go to the chancellor? Is it going to go in the newspaper? Um, mm -hmm. Who's going to sign it? Is it going to be just from me? Is it going to be supported by the planning board? Those are those are the questions. When I wrote it, uh, Bruce, you said I didn't sign it, and that was partly because I thought, I wonder who all would sign on to this letter. Uh, it would become much more effective if it was signed by multitudes of people from different areas. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any more hands. Um... And I haven't heard unanimity about kind of how to proceed with this. Would it make sense to have this on a, you know, our next meeting or to refer this to the housing subcommittee? <laughs> um, any thoughts from anyone on what we should do next? 
and that's okay, Nate. I mean, you know, would this be um, recommended to give to the town manager now to provide to UMass at one of whether it's the weekly or monthly meetings? I mean, is it, you know, does it need to be, um, you know, maybe um, updated or, um, you know, edited a bit, but is this, you know, is this something that the board would vote to say, let's just provide this to the town manager to give to UMass? And, you know, that doesn't have to be the end of it, but, um, you know, is that maybe the first step? And maybe it becomes, as Janet said, an open letter. I was kind of reading it like that. Is it just something that, you know, could then be put out there um, in different publications, but is it, you know, Oh, that was that was my thinking is that it could be voted to be provided to the um, town manager and you know see you know and if depending on that response if it you know if they if it moves forward or not then you know there's another discussion at the planning board okay well that that would be a, an option Jesse excuse me I don't know what the format would be Karen but maybe trying to gather signatures not just from planning board but from other whatever sources you can, and then delivering it to the town manager, for example, might be more impactful. <clears throat> I don't know anything about that process, but I would imagine that might be make more of a statement. Maybe canvassing a big Y as people come in and out or stop and shop <laughs> or the drape yeah, or somewhere. I, I, I guess that's true, not, not maybe canvassing, but uh having this letter signed by more than just me personally would be important and do we just give it to the town manager or do we send it directly to the uh to the chancellor i guess if we sign it as a planning board we'd have to go to the town manager i understand that i would think Maybe so that's the end of yeah. it though with my experience with the town manager uh johanna Thanks. This may run contrary to opinion on the rest of the board, but to me, this seems like an advocacy letter that is tangential to, but not central to the jurisdiction of the planning board. And I would just as soon take it offline and, you know, like, I, I, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's appropriate for us as a body to be taking this action. So if folks want to do it separately apart from the planning board, you know, by all means, but, um, you know, we've gotten pretty clear guidance from the town manager that the university relationship is something that is his role that he sees as his role. And I, for one, feel like we should respect that. Okay, uh, Janet. So I've always been perplexed by this idea that the town manager is the only person who could talk to the university because I don't see anything in the charter that says that. I think it. I could see how he'd like it that way and how it makes things easier, but I don't. I don't see that we have to report to the town manager anything really. I mean, it's you know, it, you know. Of course, we've invited him to a meeting about housing and. Of course, it's appropriate to communicate our concerns. Um, you know, the central issue of Amherst is student housing and affordable housing and, you know, and neighborhoods. And so I I think it's, you know, we're supposed to be under state statute writing a report every year to the town council about what we see as issues and things that could be happening, you know, problems in the town and solutions. And so we are an independent board and we can speak that way and we can speak to anyone that we want to. And so I think, um, I don't I don't understand this idea that we only have to communicate with the university through the town manager. I don't see the legal basis for it, the structure, and I don't see the utility of it because it really isn't working. So, you know, it's just, I don't think there's anything in this letter. And I do agree with Bruce about, you know, maybe ramping down some adjectives um, but I do think that we should think about making a statement that we really think the students need more campus housing on campus and they're residents of our town. They want it. We have people who feel like their neighborhood is overwhelmed. So I don't know. It just it seems appropriate. The planning board from where we sit, 
you know, me for five years listening to people and coming, writing us and telling us about this problem and watching buildings go up that are, you know, producing income, but are really expensive, you know, and, you know, how do you find that sweet spot in a capitalist society of who's building moderate income housing? Well, nobody. And if the state legislature understands this is a problem in our, in our state, we can go to the state and say, listen, you've funded these gorgeous buildings at UMass, but you need to house people. We need to house more students. It just seems like a pretty simple statement. It doesn't seem political. It just seems like we're saying what we see and what we know and just articulating that. Uh, Nate? You know, the town and UMass have a strategic partnership agreement and that outlines communications. And so there's a few different um, steps there. And so, you know, the housing trust was, was you know, as a, at the same time that the planning board was meeting and talking about housing last year, the trust was also talking about how can they have a better communication with UMass. And, you know, we were, you know, the question was asked, well, could we just have different UMass representatives come to trust meetings or have these working meetings? And uh, the response really was, well, you know, Tony and Nancy are happy to come to meetings and we can engage them in certain ways, but, you know, UMass is going to work through the strategic partnership agreement and the town manager's office for communication, right? They're not going to have, you know, some decision-making, um, you know, representatives come to a trust meeting and agree to do something, right? That's just not how that process works. And so, you know, that's why I was suggesting voting this to send to the town manager so that that can be this can be provided to UMass, and as you know, maybe there's other ways that it becomes public. You know, there's the petition on Whitney Street through Change.org. There's other ways to make this public. But if you wanted to get it to UMass, the you know the uh, partnership agreement really outlines that kind of communication method. If it's coming from the planning board to UMass, it should follow that process, not you know vote on it and then you know come from Doug or me or someone that. You know, I wouldn't feel comfortable as staff sending it directly to UMass and not going using the town manager's office because that's the way the role has been designated. And so I, you know, I wouldn't take this and just forward it to the chancellor's office because the planning board voted it. Right, that's not kind of the process that's been outlined. Okay, Karen. So, um, yeah, I understand that. So it seems that <clears throat> if we, as a planning board, um, sign off on it, then we can only send it to the town manager. And so the question becomes, do I not have the planning board do it and just as a personal person um, try to rev up as many people together and have it be like an open letter to the chancellor? Is that something that I can do and as a private citizen? if I'm on the planning board? Uh, oh, let's see, I guess, I think as long as you don't claim that you're acting on behalf of or you know, related to the planning board, I would think you are free to have other initiatives in your life uh, you know, without too much limitation. That's my personal opinion without any legal uh, uh, advice. Jesse. Yeah, I was just gonna say, reiterate again, I think it would be more impactful if you did that, if you were to gather many signatures and then deliver it in that format rather than trying to go through the town. Okay, Janet. I'm not, I'm not, I don't feel certain about anything right now. So I wonder, do would it make sense to talk about it at our next meeting again? Sure, we could do that. Yeah, because I'm not, I'm not, I can understand why the housing trust, which is a committee of the town and um, the town manager appoints those people is sort of maybe in a different situation where we are creatures of state statute and sort of more independent. So but I do think, you know, basically what you want to do is get the point across and get the ball rolling. And I'm not 100% sure what the next step would be. So I'm not sure how we'd vote right now, but um, I don't know if we okay. should talk about it again. All right. And, it, and I mean, it's not clear to me. I, I think if we 
referred it to Paul and said, we'd like you to give this to UMass, he would probably do that. I don't know that it would die with Paul. Uh, Bruce. Um, uh, I agree with Jesse and so forth. As I said earlier, these are not mutually exclusive, Karen. You can do both. Uh, and and, and uh, perhaps to repeat, I think uh, the uh, planning board is the uh, is is the um, this is this is the subordinate act. Um, you taking this and creating uh, a constituency and pushing it through that is the way to do this. I seem to remember in my youth when uh, we were doing this all the time, and uh, and I'm sure your youth is similar to mine. So. Just think back uh, 50 years and see what you, how you would have done it then and do that because that's the way you do these things, you know. Uh, all of this, you know, freedom, right? All, everything that was happening in our youth, don't forget that. Do it that way. That's the way to do it. And the planning board is just a, a little piece of something else. If we happen to vote for it and send it on, that would be just a, a sideshow, I think. Like your good sideshow. But it's not the show. Good Lord, no, it's not the show. You're the show. All right, thanks, Bruce. I am thinking that we probably ought to, one way or the other, wrap up this conversation in the next eight or nine minutes. Say, um, Karin, your hand was up for a little while. Do you want it? Are you all right with I, us just, I just tabling to this? Thank you. Thank you all for reading it and, and uh, thinking about it. And your comments are really helpful. So. Um, I'm not sure we need to talk about it. We'll, we'll probably personally, I'll talk to a few people and see what I plan to do. But I like the idea, Bruce, of your saying it's not mutually exclusive. So the idea of, you know, sending it to Paul to ask him to present it to the chancellor, uh, along with taking the letter and getting as many people to sign it as possible and maybe putting it in the paper or just getting a movement going, that would be great. Thank you all. All right. Okay, so time, uh, I think we're done with that topic at, at the moment for this evening. And so we'll go on to the next item on our agenda. Uh, old business, topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance. Chris or Pam, do we have anything? I don't have any old business. Pam okay. or Nate, no. Okay. Similarly, any new business? No new business. No? Form a ANR subdivision no. application? No, we just received one today, but we'll give it to you at your next meeting. Okay. How about ZBA? No. I don't have anything new to report. Okay. All right. No well, news. There, ZBA. I could tell you about a couple of things that are coming up to the ZBA, but maybe Pam told you about these already. There's a flag lot on Redgate Lane, and there's a two family house on North Whitney. The two family house on North Whitney has received a lot of attention. We've gotten a lot of letters in opposition to it because it's a non owner occupied duplex. And those are being considered by the ZBA next Thursday. Okay. Along with a nine-unit um, mixed-use building in South Amherst, which I think we've already told you about, too. It's at uh, Ron Laverdier's Amherst Office Park, and he's already got some buildings there that are pretty big. But that's another one that's coming before the zoning board. Okay. Janet? Is that is that by Potline or on off of Route 9? I always get a little confused. That is uh, on West Street. It's at the intersection of West Street and Pomeroy Lane, just north oh, of um, okay. the Slobody Building. Yep. I, I'm sorry. I always reverse Potway and Pomeroy. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, a mm -hmm. uh, special permit, site plan review, mm -hmm. SUB applications. Looks like Pam's saying yes. Well, we have we have things we sort of mentioned them earlier, and that was fifty one Hunter Hill Circle, which is the residential living, and then the Amherst College athletic fields. Yep. Those are two. Okay, all right. Those those are in the immediate future. 
Okay, so it sounds like that'll be in June. Yep, June 5th. Okay. All right, planning board committee and liaison reports. Bruce, anything from on PVPC? Uh, no, uh, there was something uh, which uh, um, I'll just look here uh, to the, uh, um, there was something I received today, which I, I, I've asked, uh, it has to do with the um, cyber, golly, come on, cold, I'm get it here. Um, uh, uh, Upcoming to assist in navigating and learning about uh, um, uh, cyber security grant. That's the, a new cyber security grant, and I uh, wondered whether uh, you all knew about that or whether I should forward this uh, note to you. I can say I don't know anything about it. It's, I think it's cyber, more to do with the town. Doesn't doesn't sound like a planning board type of thing. No, and I, 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 and I deleted two or three other things that weren't. And this one, I wasn't sure about whether the staff felt that cybersecurity was something that uh, you needed to uh, uh, know about or not. Um, well, other than our Zoom meetings, they need to be secure. Yeah. It, well, it is an issue, if I may interrupt for a minute, but we do have cybersecurity training that all staff is required to take, and it's pretty ongoing. So we're we're always in in the mix of of doing this cybersecurity yeah. training that yeah. is given to us by our IT department. And this was a this was a grant for that purpose, and that was why I it was money. Yeah. So that's why I paid attention. Yeah. Otherwise, well, maybe, I would have maybe send it off to Chris and see if she. I'll forward it to you, Chris, and you can the decide. Board should see it or not? No, no, no. I'm not thinking the board should see it. I was okay. only reporting of the. I'm supposed to be the link through the, uh, and so sometimes it's a link to the staff, I think, and not to the board. Mm -hmm. yep. But uh, to the extent that that's right, then I'll do it. Otherwise, no. Okay. That's it, Doug. I'm good. All right. Uh, I am have nothing to report on the CPAC committee. Uh, Karen, anything on design review board? No, no. We meet again on Monday. Okay. And then Chris, anything from CRC? Yes, we met with CRC last, um, when was it, Tuesday evening, and we're working on the um, a kind of uh, refinement of the solar, solar zoning bylaw. We're making slow progress, but we're making progress. Okay. And, and Janet attended that meeting, so that was good. Good. Okay. Um... Report of chair. I don't really have anything, but I, I've noticed this evening there seems to be a lag in my video compared to my audio. Is, uh, is everybody having any trouble understanding what I'm saying or nope. getting disoriented because it's not synchronized or anything? No. Nope. Good. All right. Then I'll just not look at myself during these meetings. Um, Chris, anything for report of staff? Well, only my tearjerk uh, report that we lost Rob Wachilla to East Longmeadow. And so um, that was very, it was a difficult um, thing to absorb, but um, Nate and Pam and I and the other members of conservation and development are working hard to um, take up the slack. And we also have a lovely new planning board member who went to the CRC meeting, not planning board, planning department member. She went to the CRC meeting with us yesterday. Her name is Jacinta Williams. I think I told you that she was coming, but now she's really on board and she's wonderful. She can do a lot of different things. Um, her main assignment will be to help Nate with community development block grant and eventually take that over. But right now she's jumping in and helping us with things that um, Rob Wachilla uh, left behind. <laughs> so we're, unfortunately we're struggling again, <laughs> but we'll All do right. our best. So you have another person to train. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I hope we can meet her at some point. Yes, I'd love you to meet her, yep. All right, uh, unless anybody has anything else, 
Time is 9.30 and we can adjourn. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of May and we'll see you in June. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, Pam. Stop recording. Yes, I want to.